Okay, we'll go to two break. Welcome, folks, to the July 14th, 2020 uh, Board of Selectmen meeting. And welcome, folks. We have a wonderful agenda for you and looking forward to it. So we'll begin with, um, why don't we open it again? Because we didn't. Is Diane Kennedy here? Paul Schubert here. Kevin McCarthy here. Terry Thompson here. Jack Creighton here. Okay. And for those who wish to join us and uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, you're most welcome to do so. <laughs> I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States of America, America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank he has yeah, posted the uh, bench. If you <laughs> identify yourself for the address. Russ Vanetti, 20 Parker Ave. Uh, Welcome, Russ. Thank you. Hi, Welcome. Russ. Well, looking uh, good. Yeah. <laughs> just wanted to let people know that on the uh, 27th, uh, CPC is going to have an open meeting just to find out what's out there that may be coming in. Uh, <coughs> we were getting ready for town meeting. <coughs> Chris and I were saying today will be here before we know it. Uh, people don't have to have applications ready. Uh, they don't have to have bids. Uh, we just, if they want to come in, see what they have and something we may be able to help them with. Uh, there's no guarantee that everything that comes in is going to get funded, but just letting Good. everybody know that we're open for business. Okay, so since we're on the public, why don't you explain what CPC is, what the initials are, and roughly what you do, because that'll, there are, there's <laughs> we're the Community people. Preservation Committee. According to my wife, we squander her tax dollars. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's a good <laughs> we, uh, we, we fund uh, historic preservation, we fund affordable housing, we uh, help fund the Travis House just recently. Um, I hope to have even more, and we funded uh, partially the uh, housing trust. Uh, we do recreation and open space and historic preservation. Did I already say that? Yeah. Okay. And how much do you have in the fund, uh, roughly? Come on, hold oh, on. Oh, jeez. We've got to be pushing two and a half million. Yeah. So, so you've got money to spend on projects right. as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but, you know, don't expect the drunken sailor syndrome. <laughs> No. Well, we have money we want to hold on to. We've got town hall coming up, hopefully. Uh, we have uh, affordable housing. And speaking just for myself, those are the two more important things that we're doing. I right. Think, coming up. So the date again, and where is it? It's uh, going to be in the basement on the 27th of uh -huh. January, 7 o'clock. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good public. evening. Yes, take care of us. Okay, next item on the agenda is the a review of the employee uh, handbook. For that, we're going to be having the uh, Director of Human Resources, Miriam Johnson. Oh, can identify yourself, please. Good evening, Miriam Johnson, HR Director. Welcome, Miriam. Thank you. Uh, I know that we sent you the guidebook in your packet. I don't know if you had uh, a chance to read it. It's, it's not, it, you know, it's pretty uh, chock full of a lot of information. And basically, the guidebook was written for employees who are not covered by collective bargaining uh, unit contracts, or, or they are not elected, or they don't have personal employment contracts. So this is by far the, the majority of non-union people. It replaces the terms of the personnel bylaw. So in the guidebook, most of the substance came from the bylaw. The <coughs> only additions were um, things that recent re uh, legislation uh, requires now in employment because the bylaw was aged. And those were in yellow. You put those in yellow as we went through it, right? Uh, I think they were highlighted in yellow. In some of them were, <laughs> yes. And um, and we also included policies. Um, most of those policies you have already approved and have been in place for a long time. Some of them are, again, required by law. 
So the guidebook has a number of sections. We have an overview with some uh, important information for a new hire, for example. We have a whole section on compensation to help explain how you're paid. Uh, we have a short but important section on problem resolution. Um, we have uh, you know, identified that we would really like to work with employees who have issues or concerns or problems. Uh, we have a whole section on leave of absences because uh, there are many uh, that are now required by law. Uh, we have a whole section on standards of conduct. And although we could never cover every particular circumstance, we have certainly covered the ones that we think are uh, safety oriented and professionally required in um, a town office uh, or town employment. And we have a section on benefits, although it's not detailed because benefits change, it does give a description of the benefits that we offer here for employees. And then the last section is professional development because we are committed to offering opportunities for not only training but uh, challenging work assignments and, um, and the ability to grow in your career. There are very few things that are included that are new, and they're new either because they're legally required or um, we wanted parity with the union employees. We certainly don't want our non-union employees at a disadvantage. So um, these are changes from the by personnel bylaw, and they include uh, the day after Thanksgiving as a holiday which was not in the personnel bylaw, but has been um, certainly recognized for quite a while. Uh, the availability of a tuition reimbursement plan for employees who are furthering their career, or their education uh, that's relative to their career. Increase in personal days from one per year to three per year <coughs> for parity with the unionized uh, employees. An establishment of a sick bank which uh, I don't know if you all know what a sick bank is, but basically it's a mechanism by which you can donate sick time so that if someone runs out, there is a, a kind of a catch-all. And then, um, as I mentioned, we have this problem-solving process which directly replaces the grievance process that was in the bylaw, and that was at the recommendation of our council. So we're looking for your approval so we can implement this for our non-union folks. Questions? Okay, Diane. Um, just one question. What do we do with the bylaw? Will we have to... So the bylaw was modified uh, several years back to allow the Board of Selectmen to approve a personnel or employee right. manual or manuals as recommended by the town manager, which would then replace the bylaw. So the bylaw has already been modified. To so once this is adopted, the bylaw... The old bylaw disappears and this officially replaces it. And then we can now update personnel policies on a much more professional and regular basis than having to go once a year or twice a year to town meeting. It was never, ch when, ta when this town government structure was changed 20 years ago, it never, this never followed, unfortunately, and, and it, so, and we weren't really doing HR. It was the first thing I was asked to work on when I came here. So it takes a little bit longer to get to this particular point than I'd have liked, but uh, good things come to all those who yeah. so, so we're here. So. Um, and this now standardizes what we're doing, and now allows us to continue to build uh, for the future. And it, it, this, you know, we're going to update the other policies. I think this is the first step. Uh, Carrie, just a point of clarification: Which of our town employees are not covered by collective bargaining? Obviously, police and fire and those. Types well, of no, people. police and fire are covered. No, yes, I, I mean they they obviously yes. are unionized, but um, which of our so are our not? managers are not covered. Okay. <laughs> um, some confidential employees like Tracy are right. not covered. Um, all the recreation seasonal people are not covered. Um, and we have some professionals who are not exactly managers, uh, engineers, those kinds of people are not covered. The folks okay. uh, most of the folks have their affairs. Uh, okay. So it's uh, 20, 20, 25 people maybe. Oh, well, if you include, if you include yeah, the yeah. seasonal, it gets large. But mm -hmm. on a regular basis, I would say it's closer to 30. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Diane? 
Yeah, just, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought because I, I kind of came up with another question, but just in terms of tuition reimbursement, is that reflect, is that something too that's mirroring what is in the, the union? In, in the library okay. contract. And that is something that, Chris, or is, is that something that gets budgeted somewhere? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a, uh, hey, it's not like we're going to start paying for everyone to get master's degrees or something, right? Okay. But we, if, if, in fact, this is the first year that when someone's in here, somebody's got to pay for But it, it depends on how, what kind of money they have. Right. Right. right, okay. So there's a, there's a finite, and it has to be appropriated or budgeted. Right. So, yes. Okay. If it's not there, we can't. And, and it's pre approval, does, too. Does the personnel policy go to the schools, or they're all unionized? So it, this does not cover the school side of town. Okay. Most of their folks are unionized to one extent or another, right. and they have their own set of policies at this point. Okay. So, you know, yeah. And I believe their practice is that everyone who is non union gets an. Individual at all in the bylaws or in in some kind of town personnel policy, or are they literally completely separate? The, 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 the yes. And they have the school, so the school committee has other authority to govern all of their staff. Yes, staff. great, thank you. So the about thirty full time. I'm not talking seasonal, but thirty full time. Have they ever had a chance to unionize? Is there any opportunity for them? Or is not available? Well, uh, to the best of my knowledge, they have never voted or acted out to unionize. Okay. But anyone is entitled to, uh, you know, unless you're a confidential employee. I. I yeah, most of these most folks are managers to one extent or another. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure that they would be coverable. Though again, some towns have right. some kind towns of do have. Guilds. That's I just didn't know right. if there was um, other, and other towns. That when, the po when the since the since we had you know moved in this direction, the public works facility. So this is really mostly it, it's managers and professional staff that kind of. It's a fair you know when you add them all up, it's a mm -hmm. decent number. And it, it, it was becoming it's becoming harder. You know, we need to have some kind of consistent policy. It can't just be, right. you know, we, we've we've taken some real big steps the last few years. We do performance reviews and all that, and it's time to just kind of, I think have a clear set of standards, um, which again, which are amendable. And um, mm -hmm. you know, Paul, uh, uh, the the, uh, the Family and Medical Leave Act uh -huh. is that going to be the state was talking about having paid. Time off for new parents and under the family. That uh, been under the state, state yet. under but the state law, a town would have to opt into that. Um, it, it's designed for employers who do not have rich sick time. Um, government employees have a pretty rich sick time so benefit. Be so we would have to, uh, as a town, elect yeah. in. Okay. Uh, this point, we're not recommending that. I no, we are not. I, I think what we have now is worse. robust and it works. And again, as I think Mayor points out, it's worse. the government has a really you know, good structure for these things, the private sector doesn't. So I think that was more of a catch all for that. And it is an opt in. I'm not aware of any government that's an opt in. Any other comments? Uh, anything that's in the bylaws now, is that? Being taken out, or was it taken out? Did you say? Yeah, yeah, we didn't have, have to do anything at town meeting to get rid of it. Yeah, so we already, so town already adopted a provision right. that said, upon the adoption of an annual, that would be placed. Will be erased. Yeah. yeah. So the, the yeah, annual was done. Yeah, right. So the bylaw, well, actually, it, it was adopted and now goes into effect, and it refers to the manual. And then the manual will go in. Uh, it, that section, the other, there's other sections that still govern other things like union negotiations and stuff. Those, those responsibilities haven't changed. Inside this subsection, we refer to non unionized employees. Any other comments? Okay, so Miriam, you need a motion to approve the, uh, the employee manual as updated and presented to us tonight. Yes, please. Who wants to do the honors? Uh, I move that we, um, the town council, has adopt the employee guidebook as presented. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Get it unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
stuff. Yeah, that was good stuff. Very good to see. Okay, uh, the next item on the agenda, not wondering, housing plan reduction. Yeah, why don't we keep this kind of somebody may come for us, so do we want to cover something that we can do? You know? I'm just trying to look a little bit more. Uh, want to do license permits? You know, the MS Walker right there. Do we expect anybody here for that? Uh, Peter's, Peter's coming first. Peter's oh, coming first. <laughs> <laughs> MS Walker. No, no. No, it's coming for that. No, let's do that. Yeah, we're not doing that. Why don't we wait five minutes just so in case. Do you want me to jump to my update to you on the on the sure. affordable housing piece of CJC? Or? Uh, my only concern on that is that's a a considerable I issue too. It. Someone may have, someone may be waiting to come. Oh, just, uh, just to hear the update on it. Okay. Yeah. Can you mention that this is not being covered? Yeah. Why don't we take five or ten minutes to sit and well, discuss what's not being covered? Or what about topics not reasonably anticipated, which is the film? Yeah. Because yeah, chances yeah, I mean, are that. people have right. checked right. out of the meeting yeah. at some yeah. point yeah. if they're watching from home. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's a good idea. Maybe we're going to change the agenda and move the topics not reasonably anticipated. We're going to change the present time. Second. Okay, we're now at the point of topics not reasonably anticipated. Jim, uh, an issue has come up relative to filming, and uh, Chris will now give us a briefing on that, and we'll make what decisions mm -hmm. may have been done. Is this a good copy? Uh, everybody has a copy, right. yep. So, um, a, um, a travel channel uh, had approached the town about filming uh, an episode of the show, um, which, which goes around, and I, I believe there is paranormal activity around the world. And for some reason, it has to appear out there. Um, <laughs> on a Tuesday night <laughs> So we heard of Town Hall. Uh, they had originally, yeah, they had originally planned to come to town in February, and uh, apparently their their filming schedule got juggled. So we're just going to be in front of you on the 28th. And their schedule got juggled. They asked to move it up to the 27th. So that's the day before your your next meeting. So uh, they, we we need to they kind of advance this up more quickly. Um, they have talked about that uh, going to um, this building, but I think they've kind of focused on. <coughs> Uh, the Wilson House and Bates Chandler <coughs> Museum, which are both downtown, those are historical society properties. Uh, they're working with the historical society on that, and um, so they actually have presented. Uh, they have a complete application, and uh, Chief Quigley today uh, contacted them about uh, because they police and fire haven't had, haven't had a chance to release. We talked about it this afternoon in the department meeting. So Chief Quigley uh, called them and found that, and, and so there he was. He's texted me earlier, said everything's fine, and he feels comfortable that they'll be able to move forward because you can't really park right there, right? Because the yeah. point where they're located, but they'll be able to. He said move, uh, put some trucks uh, on the far side, in the little lot we have on Pleasant Street, and, and then this is not giant, you know, production vehicles. These are vans. This is a small shoot. It's like ten or twelve people coming uh, and, and a couple of staff and some crew. So. Um, so in, in layman's language for the public as well as us house, what are they going to be doing? What are they shooting? So I guess they'll be filming indoors primarily at those two locations um, and working with the historical site because they're their properties. So. What is this, this feeling about? Uh, uh, it's about, again, as far as I understand, it's about, it's about the supernatural and ghosts. <laughs> so I, I have not heard about it. I mean, I know that Jackie Dorms has, covered, here. <laughs> Jackie Dorms has <laughs> covered ghost stories and I think some of her books. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not personally familiar with ghosts <laughs> at those locations. Uh, I do know that some years back, a show did come to this building yeah, and filmed in the basement. Yeah. Uh, but I, uh, so make sure they have the right were, ghosts. Were they too afraid <laughs> to come to this building? Is that why they maybe, took it off their list? Maybe, or, or maybe these are new... Uh, we don't want to offend any ghosts that exist here. <laughs> right. Uh, I believe they're looking to film in the evening for the whole atmosphere of the whole thing. Um, <laughs> no street closings. There's no street closings. Um, they're not setting up outside. Except is, is Jackie right Domas our historical person plugged into this? Because she could advise us to. Well, the historical well, society. Yeah, the historical <laughs> society itself. It's their property. So, uh, and I know they've been working with Kathy O'Malley. Okay, the fine. So, uh, I'm sure that they'll. You know, I'm sure she could. Maybe they'll have her on. They the all show. know. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, uh, um, so it seems it's a. It's it's a fairly it seems to be a fairly low impact. Um, I, I would still um, condition any approval on making sure the police and fire have signed off and are totally comfortable. Because again, a phone conversation today was great. But yeah, they want to do this on the twenty seventh. Uh, I'd say the motion would condition that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but again, I did have Chief Goodwin did follow up today. So um, I, I, I it sounds <coughs> unique. I mean, it's never a bad thing to have our uh, you know this. I don't know what happened to those buildings, but you know, having a little with the two fiftieth year and everything else, having a little publicity about the town is never a bad thing. So, mm -hmm. uh, and it's fairly low impact, as far as I can tell. Okay. Any questions, comments? 
Okay, I want someone want to do a motion relative to this, and if they do, would they include? It would be contingent upon approval of the the usual approval of the fire and the chief departments. Anybody want to do a motion? I move that we approve the filming um, in the town of Cohasset in the two properties in the application by Painless Television for January 27, 2020, contingent upon the approval from the police and fire department. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. That's unanimous, Tracy. Just a follow up there. Yeah. It, it's this, um, we do approvals for filming yes. in town. Yeah. Um, even on private property, in which case this this is that. Um, um, and we set up a uh, policy for this a number of years ago in, when we did we reviewed all the event policies. It's just probably something we should review again or just kind of look at and familiarize ourselves with it because you know they're not impacting anything. Yeah. You know the question is. What are we doing? And then, you know, if it's a big studio show, what are what are fees, if there are fees, that kind of thing. So it would be helpful for me to just understand kind of where that policy lies and whether there is any updates. Oh, this was a big step, but we didn't have this form a couple of years ago. Right. Yeah. In fact, I think the other thing is they're looking to use a, a fog machine to create atmosphere. Right. It's an eerie feel to right. the Right, as you walk in. And so in, the, in that way, they're on a sidewalk, which is right. public right. space. Right. But but again, I'd love to understand the parameters a little bit better in terms of the policy that we have. Okay, well, if you put on that as a list yep. of things, Somewhere. oh, for sure, the next time we do a film thing, let's com combine it with a review that evening of the policy. So yep. we're yeah, familiar with what that policy is before we do it, okay? So I will pass this along. All right, very good. Uh, I think that puts us back. Uh, yeah, we can just a couple minutes. I think it's close. I think everyone's here. Is everyone here? Is it everyone here? <laughs> There's a voice from the background. There's <laughs> another person. I think we can go ahead and do the housing production uh, plan. Next steps on the affordable housing steering committee. Those who are here to present with that, if they'd come forward and introduce themselves. And this is a. Hey, okay. good to see you again. We're obviously not talking about beer bottles. Mm. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Welcome back, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> good evening. Happy You've been New back Year. All day, right? Yes. I have, yes. Happy New Year. Welcome to both of you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, Rob Jeffers, 18 Spring Street. Lauren Lynn, Planning Director. So I'll begin, um, as you know, Rob Jeffers is the chair of the Affordable Housing Steering Committee, and tonight we'll be talking about the status update of the housing production plan. I'll begin by giving an intro on what a housing production plan is, why we're doing this, and then Rob will begin with the details of what's in the plan. So a housing production plan um, is a locally adopted and state-approved document that assesses housing needs, the status of housing here, and what our goals and capacity is. It uh, allows us to look for um, opportunities to increase our housing stock, particularly in, a, in terms of affordable housing as well. And it's very important, um, the housing production plan can be a first step towards temporary safe harbor from the Chapter 40B. Um, Chapter 40B is a state statute um, targeted towards housing. What it really intends to do is encourage municipalities to develop affordable housing. Cross has been on the, uh, our housing stock has been 10% of the affordable on the subsidized housing inventory for the state for quite some time. However, um, we are projecting that with the next census, as we've had more housing stock development that's not been affordable, we're going kind of backwards on that number. So we're projected with the next census to fall below the 10%. And what that means is that we then potentially have a risk for 40B development, a comprehensive permit that has the opportunity to override and supersede local zoning. So it's particularly important that we stay on top of this, as we all know that's one of your identified goals for the year is to continue to achieve and produce and maintain that 10%. So um, this plan, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I, I forget where we are now. <laughs> um, okay, so after this goal, we this will give us a roadmap to getting to our 10%, achieving our goals, and something that's consistent with the community of the character. We began working on this plan with a consultant from Metropolitan Area Planning Council, which is our regional planning organization, uh, in the fall of 2018. And they've been working very diligently with the Affordable Housing Steering Committee for quite some time to shape the goals and get the idea of what, what this community wants to see for our future housing goals and needs. And um, something that I want to just 
make clear is that the next steps will be, um, we'll hear in a moment what's really in the plan, but we ultimately will need to have this adopted by both the planning board and the board of selectmen, and then it will go to the state for approval. However, that's not, just having a, a state approved plan is not safe harbor, but you can seek to then make measurable progress on the goals in the plan. If you um, increase your housing production for affordable housing by 0.5% and you are showing, even if you're not at the 10% and you are making progress, you can potentially have a, a one year of safe harbor until you get to that 10%. So um, I just wanna, again, highlight that even completing this plan and having it state approved does not get a safe harbor, but is the prerequisite to getting to that point. Okay, so what is the timing then on that being reviewed and approved by both the selectmen and the planning? Um, so when, when, so is, when are we going to be able to get that done? We will have a better idea of that. We plan to have the um, revised draft of the housing production plan by the last week of January, which we will circulate to you. And then we would plan to schedule a joint meeting with the planning board and the board of selectmen, hopefully uh, sometime in February, if that's available. So we could do that as a joint meeting and do the approval then? Correct. Yeah. And then we would submit to the state. Seemed to me we should move along on that. Yeah. Unless the board is hearing and yeah. hearing anything different. Yeah. So we want you to go ahead and yeah. could and move along on that. Yes. We yeah. do see the importance mm -hmm. of it. Certainly. So without further ado, I'll let Rob um, so explain the new plan. So the public say now what Rob will do is explain what is in our actual plan sure. for the public as well. Correct. Because yeah. what's actually in our uh, housing production plan. So Rob, go ahead. Sure. Just like to mention, we do have a couple members of the affordable housing committee, uh, Susan Sardina and Beth Tarpey. Welcome, Susan. Welcome. Yeah. Nice yeah. to see you tonight. Going down this, uh, this, this road. Thank you. So, uh, kind of the housing production plan has a couple different uh, you know, aspects. It goes through the numbers, it goes through demographics, both you know the past, current, and kind of projects. <coughs> uh, looks at potential you know, development areas and sets up goals and strategies. So, I'm just going to go at a very high level over, over that. Uh, the numbers, as we mentioned, in 2010, we were at 10.7% with 311 uh, affordable housing units. Since 2010, we have grown, our affordable housing units have not, and so we are now, at, as of 2017, we were at about 9.4%. Uh, so we expect by 2020, uh, you know, we're going to be in that 9% range, meaning we're going to need about 20 to 30 units uh, in order to get to the 10%. By, by when? Uh, so the, the goal, really? that kind of goes into our goals. Uh, if um, we were able to, the 2010 census will not actually be out until 2011. So, I mean, sorry, 2020. 2020. Sorry, I'm, I'm going back in time. 1999, <laughs> 10 years ago, right? Yeah, so. Uh, so the 2020 census will be out in 2021. So if in 2020 and 2021, we were able to meet our goal of by approximately 22 or, or so units, uh, we, we hit the 10%, we'd be, in, you know, we, we'd be fine. Uh, alternatively, if we can show a half percent, you know, uh, basically halfway there, you know, increase by 2021, we'd have safe harbor for another year. So that, that, that's kind of the timing. In, in general, you know, by having this, that, that, that's kind of helpful and will, kind of, will help discourage, you know, somebody who's going, hmm, let's should I come to Cohasset. They're actually working on it. Um, and, you know, as long as we are showing progress, that's going to make it a lot, it's going to make it tough for, for anybody to come in. Um, from uh, the demographics, uh, for in 2010, uh, what we're seeing is, you know, residents over 60 made up about 22%. By 2030, we expect that to be almost a third of the population, 31%. Uh, young adults are still, like, so 20 to 29 are still relatively low, but we do see, you know, from growth to, uh, to 2030 for that to double. You know, so definitely seeing more younger and more uh, older uh, you know, individuals, and so they have specific, uh, you know, housing needs. We also expect that the housing stock will need to grow more than the uh, the population. You know, we anticipate that Cohasset is going to continue to grow, uh, but what we're seeing is uh, less people per unit. You know, so you actually need more houses to you know, <coughs> for less people. Uh, from a from an income standpoint, you know, Cohasset, as you all know, has seen you know a, a great deal of, uh, of growth in affluence. Uh, the median income is approximately one hundred twenty eight thousand, uh, compared to uh, Norfolk overall is ninety and Mass is seventy one. So we definitely have you know an affluent group, but twenty one percent of the population is considered low income, 
and 34% have a uh, cost burden for, for housing. That means that more than 30% of their income is going towards, towards their housing. So not everybody's uh, there. An interesting fact that we came up with is somebody making the median income for Cohasset could not afford a medium priced house in Cohasset. So uh, what we have been seeing uh, that you know we are building a lot of big houses, like a lot of the permits are for, for larger houses, meeting the need for some of the, the, the affluent. 49% uh, of our houses have more than, are four bedrooms or more. Um, and only 11% are studios or one bedrooms. So there aren't that many uh, units for the, the individuals that might be in that, uh, that lower end of the income. Uh, and we're seeing that most of the permits for, for housing has been for, for, for larger housing in the recent, uh, recent history. Um, there's a lot more detail, just so you know, like the housing production plan, you, you know, we sent you the executive summary, which was about seven pages. The housing production plan, I think, is up to 140. So it goes into a lot of detail, and there's a lot more data on this. Uh, but they, taking that, uh, we looked at potential development areas. Uh, MAPC uh, looks at it in two ways. One is purely quantitative. So we put the you know, where stuff is, you know, what's open, what's, you know, what lands are available. Um, and w what it spits out is, you know, Cohasset Village and northern part of uh, Route 3A would make sense because it's near commuters or it's near, um, you know, places for people to go and shop, you know. So Plus it, there's a lot of land there, too. Yeah, it has to be, empty, you know, open land. You know, we don't want to suggest stuff like on right. top of golf courses or things like that. Right. Um, and so that's, and they're basically looking at, you know, everything. We also did uh, quite a few uh, public hearings and meetings to get input, and that <coughs> primarily was the same. You know, it's like what people th thought was, um, you, know, you know, it made a lot of sense. They also mentioned the harbor uh, as an area because that's close to uh, services that people could go to. Challenge there is waterfront property tends to be a lot more uh, expensive and harder harder to get, but you know, potential you know you know areas around there. Uh, we also dig into specifics, you know, so uh, specifically we named a few, uh, you know, sites that should be looked at by, you know, the planning board or us in uh, conjunction with the uh, Affordable Housing Trust. You have things like 808 Jerusalem, which we've spoken about many times be before. Uh, there's an area, a quarter eight, uh, four tenths of an acre um, so, uh, around South Main, uh, which would be close and walking into the village uh, for bigger uh, developments. There's 11 acres behind Walgreens. There's 14 acres by the Music Circus. Now, all of this would, of course, have to go through and make sure that it's suitable. I, I can see Jack looking at me, going, "Yeah, there's marshland and stuff like that." <laughs> uh, so it's like it's, it's just we're just looking at where are the potential places that we could could look for for more areas. Not that this definitely uh, Diane, do you want needs to be. It? Yeah. Do you mind if I interrupt sure. with, uh, with a question, which is um, on that land? Is that just land that's owned by the town, or you're not like identifying? parcels that are privately owned. So uh, is like yeah, I think in general, most policy. of this is owned by the town or is not developed. You know, so for example, 808 Jerusalem is owned by the town. I'd have right. to double check. Some of um, the, if I can interrupt, I'm yeah. sorry. Some of them are privately owned, but um, a member of our affordable housing steering committee knows the owner. So okay. they are. That well, makes me a little uncomfortable. Yeah, it, was, it had been discussed previously, right. and we've had mm -hmm. informal discussions. Um, for example, for this one on South Main, yeah, to actually right. we applied for a housing production type of grant for that. So that's been in the discussion with the owner. So it, this wouldn't be a shock to them. Okay. We're not suggesting any eminent domain. Right. 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 This is like this would be yeah. something. I was at a CMC meeting a number of years ago, yeah. and somebody was like, "Well, what about this property?" And I'm like, "Somebody owns it. Yeah. They're not here. Yeah. We can't talk about that." Now, so all of these have kind of been vetted to to some extent, you know, in that you know, if either it's the, if the town owns it, or you know, we did have people at, at the meetings who have expressed interest, <coughs> and we think it's you know a potential possibility that, that that's worth looking at. Uh, we also set up, um, you know, goals and strategies. Obviously, the main goal, as what we've already talked about, is 40B compliance. Uh, the aggressive one is by 2021 to hit the 10 percent. Makes everything easy. We have safe harbor, nothing to worry about. Uh, you know, kind of a secondary one, if we don't, if we feel that's too much, is to get halfway there by uh, 2021. So we have the safe harbor as long as this has been passed and given to the state. And then it only gives you safe harbor for another year, so you still have to continue to show uh, you know, you know, progress. Um, we, for, we also want to uh, increase the naturally occurring affordable housing. So once you hit the 40B, 
it kind of gives us the control to look at are there other things we can do. And as we mentioned in the demographics, uh, there are items that might not put something in the affordable housing stock, but is affordable. We, we've spoken about this previously as capital A and lowercase a. So this is kind of the lowercase a uh, items. And when we go into our strategies, you'll hear a few of those that are very, uh, you know, uh, you know, geared toward that, that lowercase a. In looking at what type of projects we want to do, uh, we, the areas that we've identified are uh, senior housing or helping people, seniors stay, stay in their home, uh, workforce housing, uh, veterans. And then actually, one of the, the topics <coughs> we discuss a lot is real affordable housing. So the, the state kind of allows a little bit of a loophole. You know, we have all of these, you know, uh, units up in Avalon. They're not all affordable, but they all account in our security ha housing. So our, even though we might say we have 10%, the reality is there's only 5% out there for, for the individuals to, uh, to apply for. Um, so we do feel that it's important to keep an eye on that. Uh, and try to actually make sure we are building uh, the, the actual affordable housing stock for, for the people that, uh, that need it. Uh, the strategies that we, uh, we think that are important is you know, looking at uh, continuing to partner with non, uh, nonprofit partnerships. So for example, Habitat for Humanity or you know, other <laughs> groups like that. Uh, expanding the aging at home. Uh, there, is, there are some programs that we already do. Um, I can't remember the names, uh, the Cohasset Cares uh, program to help seniors stay in their home, making sure that, you know, maybe spending some time and effort, you know, promoting that, making sure people know about it. Um, that's kind of a lowercase a uh, type thing. Uh, CPA funds, you guys have already done uh, s some work on that. I know there's some, you know, items on the warrant uh, to actually make it so that we can do things. Um, you know, we have some funding, uh, and that could be whether we're partnering with Habitat or another thing that we've discussed here before is there are town-owned rentals that aren't deeded or pseudo town-owned uh, you know, rentals, historical society or things like that, where potentially we could work with those, uh, those groups to make those deeded properties um, and we could potentially use CPA funds for that. Uh, continue to uh, work with the state to get funding uh, by having a um, HPP that opens up more grants and more opportunities for us to uh, to apply for. So we think that there's a uh, <coughs> money there. Also to look at these two kind of are, are, are um, together um, opportunities for denser or cottage style housing. Uh, we think this is something that we've talked to the zoning board about. Are there areas where we could you know potentially make things affordable by just having less land um, and having you know we we have heard from a lot of the, you know, especially the seniors, is that they'd like to downsize, but you really can't do that in Cohasset, or it's very hard to, mm -hmm. to do that in Cohasset. Um, and also mixed use uh, opportunities on 3A, and kind of that northern uh, part of 3A that we, we, we talked about. Um, there are a lot more strategy, there's a lot more items, there's a lot more ideas than we could ever possibly do, all in that 140 pages that you will receive. Uh, but kind of at a high level, this is where we came out. We think there's some good strategies. Um, as Lauren mentioned, the next steps, one of the other things we do want to do even before we, we come back to you guys is uh, sit down with the Affordable Housing Trust, mm -hmm. just to make sure they understand what's, what, what we have here, make, see if they have any feedback. Uh, before we finalize this, because you know we'll have to be going, through, we'll be going through them uh, for any sort of funding. Once we do that, you know we work with uh, you and the planning board to get this officially approved. Um, but and just so everybody's clear, just by approving it doesn't mean we're going to do all these things. It just means that this is uh, you know areas that we're going to focus on, and every single project still has to go through all the normal you know approvals. And, you know, we won't be taking land and building stuff. Thank you very much. Any comments here? Yeah. Just a comment, which is that the Affordable Housing Trust is meeting on um, Monday morning, January 27th. And I just made a note, too, because that that evening is when CPC is meeting for ideas. So I'll <coughs> send an email to you and Jen tomorrow because it might be a good idea to, yeah. to have Affordable Housing Steering Committee and the HPP on that agenda. Yeah. And then decide, you know, we at least go to CPC and socialize some ideas that have been voted and agreed on. Hey, Jack. Yeah, um, I've, we've had discussions of this before. I think one of the real important <coughs> things 
is to make uh, kind of a accessory units. There's been some work on that that didn't seem to produce those. There were some restrictions, but the idea is that if you have some homes that are larger and the kids have moved away, they can take apart, put in you know, what we would call an in-law or just a yeah. market rate yeah. or a, an apartment in the house. There are some things that I think we could change on that. The other thing that this does, which is a, um, an intended benefit, is many of the seniors, if they have somebody who is living and sharing, that will help them age in place because they might have somebody who could shovel or walk. They might have somebody who's there if they slip and fall. So, and, and I think um, with the number of large houses and the number of seniors who are staying, that that could probably significantly impact that. And I know we've had discussions in the past on that. But I just want to mm -hmm. put that out there. I think that's a very good, sound, long-term policy. Yeah, and I think that's something when we're looking at, you know, helping people stay age in place that yeah. kind of fall under there. Uh, that would be probably more into the lower case, say, you know, affordable mm -hmm. housing. Um, so kind of like first mm -hmm. we want to get the, the, the 40B. But, yeah, definitely as we, once we get that, you know, mm -hmm. is those are, you know, great ideas on how to actually come up with stock that people can afford to live in. But if they were to rent, for instance, if it was a small one bedroom, the rent level presumably could be sufficiently low or we could maybe set it. So if it is sufficiently low, then that would count towards the 10%, would it not? Could we Only, do see, the, the two challenges that we find on okay. personal units is you have to deed that so that it can, it can never not be affordable. And if that's uh -huh. part of your house, you might not want to do it. Yeah. You don't have complete control of who's going to live there. Right. So that's going to, so I, I think it's something that we definitely can do to <coughs> create housing that people can afford. But I don't know if we're, how much of a take up we'd have with those types of okay. restrictions. Well, we'll come to your next meeting and, and yeah. we'll yeah. work it out. Um, <laughs> Lauren? I just wanted to add on that topic that another initiative I'm working on with MIPC is um, a case study for different communities, including Duxbury, Hingham, Situate, different communities on the South Shore, looking at different styles of housing options. It was previously called Living <coughs> Little, but uh, it was we renamed it because it's not just about tiny houses. We're exploring things like accessory dwelling units and different kinds of alternatives that are an option other than single family housing. So with the results of that study, we'll have some ideas and uh, opportunities for revising our bylaws that are suggested by MAPC to achieve things like that. Good, so. great. Um, we've had to talk before, I just wonder what the status that's relevant on this here on the West Corner property and I know we've, we've had that presentation a few months ago, but we haven't heard any since then. How yeah, there's, there's a couple of organizations that went through some further conversations and I expect those to pick up again mm -hmm. now. <coughs> we might want to partner on them. Um, Are you aware of those projects? The 808? Yeah. Yeah, yeah very yeah, it's very on you four years now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't Can we do something, please? Anything? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, thought, I thought we were further along on that. The, yeah. yeah. No. The, it, it ended up sort of getting sideburned as the affordable housing trust got up to speed, and then we changed planning directors, and then we got this piece moving. So the good thing is the line's not going anywhere. It's, it's there, um, and the, the need has not gone away. Uh, I know that this uh, we we talked about habitat, and, and, and we uh, and, and that's one organization. And I think there's another group that has expressed an interest. We talked about we, we, we were been right. there right. months yeah. ago. So yeah, well, that's you know, yeah. It, it was. And then yeah. it got yeah. sideburned as a result. Again, we, we had we switched planners. Uh, and the plan. Sure. No, no, no. It wasn't here. It was <laughs> no, the, the, it, there, was, there was work that I expected to have done that, that didn't happen. Um, and, uh, and there's been a lot of other things on the plate at this point. So we're just pretending. Well, can speed, I, so. at the liberty, yeah. give you the extra emphasis direction of what we're doing? Mm -hmm. is that we want that more accelerated than it's been, and we'd like to get that moved along as soon as practical. The, is that the, my the, yeah. board? You get it done. The, the, uh, trust, yeah. the trust Paul? is really the Paul first. Um, yeah, the, there's one thing. There's a, I think a legal aspect of the trust being able to accept yep. gifts, money, uh, land, and it has to be approved at the Commonwealth level, I believe. So there is some legal requirement for just the construction of the trust to make it a uh, legal entity in the eyes of the Commonwealth. So that's one thing that's important. This is so the structure is now catching up with the goal. So once the trust is official, official with this document of trust, which is in production, in fact, it's being worked on right now, uh, and hopefully they'll be able to either hopefully adopt it uh, at their next meeting, and that will get filed. At which point.
way they can get this back on faster track. Yeah, yeah and, then, then, and then this would be one of this would be the trust first project really to, to come. Okay. Yeah, so good. again, I want to emphasize to whoever's involved that the, this board wants to move along as fast as possible. Let us know anything you need. We, that's a, we should be okay. Did I say that enough? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> The other thing was, is that I do have to observe, um, you know, over the years this has been discussed, and usually, from my memory anyways, we're closer to the 10%, or we've always been a little bit above it, but what I heard at the beginning of this presentation, you know, we've fallen lower than the 10, toward the 9%, more than I actually thought yeah. that we were, so mm -hmm. I clearly can see we're getting into the danger yeah. zone of having, you know, development that we're not in control of, so it's very timely to the board yeah. of that we made this a priority, but... Mm -hmm. uh, I just would make that observation. We're a bit further below that, and that uh, we've made it a goal, and we want to look at all opportunities in this town to actually get these affordable units done. Because uh, if a 40B crisis or problem hits the town, it, it creates right. quite a lot of disruption, which is why you've done it. That said, I'm pretty impressed by what I've heard, mm -hmm. what I've heard tonight. Uh, but yeah. the board wants anything you need from us, come back anytime, wherever you need it. Uh, this is, uh, you. you seem to be quite on top of it, but the problem's a little worse than I actually had thought yeah. about. So. Yeah, and just so you, we, there's always potential for um, surprises in the census. Right? Oh, so, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a lot of units that are considered seasonal. Yeah. People answer the questions differently and decide that those are not seasonal. Right. All of a sudden, <laughs> our overall housing has increased. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's without building a single thing. Right. It's the existing stuff that is that's here, but we do have, I'd say, several, over a hundred, you know, I think between one and two hundred houses that are considered um, seasonal and they'll start coming back into the stock. That could be a challenge. Right. For every ten, we need one more so, affordable. Uh, Diane, then Carrie. Just, just a quick question on the, what's the process for actually getting accepted as safe harbor? I mean, is that something you like apply for and who adjudicates that and how does that work? Yes, maybe through the Department of Housing Community Development. <coughs> you would you would present like on an annual basis, we're here, this is our plan, we've made this measurable goal, and they'll review and send us a letter and say you're good for right now. Yes. It's every time you add units to the you submit an application to have units added to the SHI, then they have to accept those units and then they'll update your number and it's a process for the state. Carrie? I just didn't know. So seasonal units were not included in the full numbers? If the person answers on the census that it's not their full-time residence, it's okay. just the seasonal uh, residence, then it doesn't count that in the denominator uh, gotcha. for, the, for the housing. Okay. Good we learned know. a lot about this right. over the first year. Mm -hmm. Order. Trying to figure out how many houses are here is not as easy as you think. <laughs> yeah. Can't just go count them. You know? No. <laughs> oh. uh, anything else? Okay, I, I think this is, uh, you've done a very impressive professional job on this. You seem to be very on top of what was a very important mm -hmm. thing for us, and uh, it's a big goal and an ongoing goal for the town. So thank you for your presentation, okay. and again, let us know if you need anything. Mm -hmm. Thank you, you back, sir. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> well done. Yeah, thank you guys. Okay, good. All right. Uh, next item we have is uh, hey, good. Uh, housing production. Uh, we're on the uh, board committee appointments. The first one is Master Plan Implementation Committee. It is Jennifer Hall and Citizen at Large open opportunity here. So, whoever, uh, would you come forward? Uh, Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me. Yes, Jennifer, nice to meet you. So, are you here for the master plan? Okay. I am. Is it okay? Yes. So, usually what you can do is introduce yourself, give your address, who you are, and then what your interest is in the master plan, and anything else you want to say in terms of an introductory nature in here. Okay. Uh, my name is Jen Boylan. I live on Sawyer Street, close to the library. Um, been in Cohasset for a oh, so a little over six years and grew up in Hingham, so I'm not a social native. <coughs> and um, was kind of introduced to the idea of joining the committee through our friends and had met Harry, who indicated that there was a vacancy. Um, and it kind of aligns with just generally I care a lot about the town and would love to give back and um, find ways to help. And then I think obviously um, it's a really interesting time for the town. There's a lot of growth and a lot of change, but you know, I'm very interested in kind of 
trying to help find that balance of preserving all the special aspects of the town while kind of making it livable for the future. And so I would love to participate. Good. Uh, great. Any uh, questions on the board for Jennifer? Thank you yeah. for applying. Thank you. <laughs> we Thank you very it. much. So it was a very, very important <coughs> writing committee. Yeah. It's a lot of work. And I'm sure if you haven't been, there's a lot of work to be on these committees mm -hmm. with meetings and assignments. And this committee's, you know, you're right at the forefront of what's going to be important in terms of a lot of big issues. So yeah. it is a lot of work. And I hope that you're ready for that. <laughs> Carrie told you that. Or did she, did she not tell you that? Not okay. that much. Another one, Carrie? Come on. Do it. But, um, so anyways, we're delighted to have you here. Yeah. Any other questions of Jennifer? No. Okay, is there a motion? Right. Well, Carrie, what sure, are you yes. Very sure. exciting, yes. Motion to approve Jennifer Boylan as citizen at large for the Master Plan Implementation Committee for a term of what is it, three, three years. Three years. Okay, so now you second. aware of what three years is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Second. I don't think I told her that. I, so. I, I, I already <laughs> second. Second. We're second at quick. Let's second vote. <laughs> okay, all of any questions? Yeah, all of you say aye. 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 Jennifer. Now, let us tell yeah, you what no. all about. <laughs> we didn't want to tell her that much. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. We look forward to your Thank contribution. You, Thank you, Jeff. Okay, the next item on the agenda is uh, open space uh, and committee, open space and recreation representative, and that is to the National Plan. Ready. Good evening, Peter Pescatore, Chairman of the Open Space Rec. Uh, we just completed our meeting, and uh, Tom Callahan will be our representative on the uh, whatever it is, the Master Plan. It's called the Implementation Committee. Implementation Plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, why is there a Master Plan Implementation Group rather than <coughs> a Master Plan Group implement their work? as all the other committees, like Open Space and the Harvard Committee, yes. we implement our plans. Why right. isn't the Standing Committee implementing their plans? So the idea that we have, and I don't, the idea we have on the Master Plan Implementation Committee is that we have these major plans that we the Harbor Plan, the Recreation Which Plan. Which they're most the familiar with because they developed them. And, and the Master Plan too, as well as the Recreation and, and others. So, what we uh, wanted to do, the concept is, is that rather than have these individually greatly produced plans go off maybe in different directions and that are not thoroughly coordinated with the town and so forth, that we would have a committee that would, would overview and review and coordinate mainly what's going on between the various major projects that we've had developed, the Harbor Plan, the uh, Master Plan, the, uh, the Recreation Plan. So, and the purpose of that is to have that committee with a representative from each of those existing ones is as some others to make sure that we do this in a proper coordinated way. So in a way it's similar, I suppose you could say, to a master plan implementation, but it's, you know, in the, in the way we define it is the way you described it, in the way I just described it. Yeah. Anybody so want to add to that? So what should the Open Space and Rec Committee do now? Because we've been implementing the action plan steadily for the last two years. Continue implementing, and uh, you're going to have a representative. And the first meeting of the Master Plan Implementation Committee has been scheduled already for January 21st, and your representative will be there, okay. and the coordinations will begin. Now, Peter, again, this is fairly new, so I think it'll work in a good coordinated fashion. If by any chance it doesn't, yeah. We will definitely be flexible to looking at other ways for it to work, but that's the idea. No, I just never got an explanation. I just no, that's right. I'm there's a curious a, person. So. There's a great um, the charge for the committee is written in on the website, and I, I think that you, you should review it because I think you'll be happy. It's it's really I'll all. Have Tom review. It's not the right, yeah. <laughs> but it's it's not you know as Kevin said, it's really just it's all <coughs> these plans and making sure they work in, in concert with each other and yeah. everybody knows what each other's doing and nobody's going off in this direction without. And in the open space plan in particular is a part of the master plan. So uh, yeah. it just makes sense. Yeah. Also, and I know you're satisfied with the press, but, but another thing too is, is we want to make sure that the things that actually came up to be done actually got done. And that central coordination, and we're particularly conscious of having our planning director be a key part of this, it'll make sure that things that we want to get done actually get done. That was part of it. So let's we'll see how it goes six months, three years. Yeah. And thank Good. you for making a representation. I'm sure Tom will make an excellent uh, 
uh, remember he's not here tonight. Does he have any questions for you? Or <coughs> you have any questions? Uh, no, we didn't really know what the charter yeah. was. So did your committee in, um, in, in uh, recommending him, Tom yes. Kelly? Yes. Okay. yes, absolutely. Okay, any discussions? Do you want a motion? Any mo motions on this? I move that we appoint Tom Callahan as the Open Space and Recreation Committee representative to the Master Plan Implementation Committee. Second. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. That's it. Unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. I have to stay. You're, yeah, you're saying okay. it's okay. Yeah. Oh, actually, and I'm just saying, when is the item? Our desk is a map for you, right? Hold on. We can take it. I mean, we could do, you know, uh, let's. Are you here for uh, Safe Harbor 2 or just the. Uh, yes. All of the above. You're here on Safe Harbor as well. Okay. okay, so the next item on the agenda is the Safe Harbor Committee. We're going to have an update. So we're going to be making that presentation. Yes, I'm a board member. Yeah. And your name? Peter <laughs> <laughs> should be yeah. Yeah. And you can introduce yourself. Nicole Balashi, Program Director at Safe Harbor Club. Welcome, Nicole, and welcome again, Peter. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I've always been a presentation with me. I'm a big visual person. Um, and I was asked to come this evening to give an update as to where we are with the coalition. Um, January 22nd of this year marks about give or take three and a half years into the DFC, the, the Drug Free Community Federal Funding, um, and also two years in me being in that position. Um, <coughs> so as the slides come up, I always well, like to bring it back to why we're here and what we're doing. The driving force for Safe Harbor is that we want to have a healthy, substance-free community for the youth. Um, and how do we get to that vision? through our mission, which is to foster a strong, inclusive, educated, responsible um, community that, that instills those choices around drug and alcohol use. And we do that through communication and collaboration. Um, how do we get to that vision? And, and how do we choose as a coalition what we're going to do next, programs, events, curriculum, whatever it may be, it has to come back to protective factors outweighing the risk factors. Um, and I won't get too much into it, but what a protective factor is, is um, you know a characteristic or a strength for an individual, family, community that really um, helps mitigate any type of risky behaviors. So that could be social skills, self-worth, um, you know, having pro-social involvement in the school or the community and family skills. Um, where the risk factors could be that psychological, biological risk factor, like um, family history of addiction or rebellious or um, not having a community that gives opportunities to have pro-social involvement. So you could have five million risk factors, but as long as the protective factors outweigh that, you're less at risk or an individual is less at risk of developing a mental health issue or a substance use disorder or et cetera. Um, so I like to always mention that because some people are confused as to what we're doing and why we choose to do what we're doing. So mm -hmm. always come back to the protective factors and risk factors. Um, and those are just examples. So for the drug-free community grant, we have two main driving goals. The first goal here is to increase and strengthen community collaboration. And the second goal is to um, reduce substance use, substance use amongst our youth. Um, we had an outside evaluator come in and evaluate where we are. Um, and so each goal is broken down into four objectives that you can see up on the screen. First one is to formalize relationships with local boards or organizations. Um, second one is to increase our youth membership and their involvement. Um, three is to increase adult, adult membership. And then that last one is to make sure that our community members, our coalition members are satisfied, so do they feel like they're putting input, are they being heard? Um, so we hit all of those first three, which you'll see in the next couple of slides. That last um, objective, we are in the process of creating a survey and focus group to kind of PLL engage mm -hmm. those who are involved in the coalition. So the first one, increase our formalized um, <coughs> relationships with local boards and organizations. We've increased since 
I've been in the position um, from eight to 18. And that this is just a list of our businesses that have partnered with us or sponsored some of our events. Um, but there are more to mention like PSO and the Cohasset Police Board of Selectmen. Um, we have a lot of partners. So the next one will show our youth involvement. Um, last year we launched our youth ambassador program and that got us up to 17 active youth. We do have more youth involved, but they're not our active showing up every single week being part of all these um, projects. So we launched year two in September and we retained those 17 and then we also recruited uh, an extra. So we're up to 26 active youth members. Um, four of those are youth leaders. So they are four high schoolers that facilitate the group. It's I just, um, sure. I really got to highlight in a community as small as we have mm -hmm. in this day and age, these numbers that Nicole has given it's in amazing. terms of <coughs> active Cohasset students stepping forward. I mean, originally it was less than 10 was what we were really, you were really hoping for, I yeah. believe. And originally well, two, began, I, would have, I was happy yeah. with two is what I said. Right. 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 <laughs> eight or nine. It's now in this town this small, yeah. 17 and more, that have, that have put themselves yeah. forward openly, that are working on opioid and addiction <coughs> for their fellow students. It's absolutely an astounding, mm -hmm. you know, the great ac accomplishment, and I just uh, uh, I want to highlight that. And it also shows, too, I think um, that times have changed where young people nowadays, and we're not all that group anymore, but young people nowadays, and each generation is a little different, seems that there's a lot of hope I see yeah. for young people nowadays because you see them more and more in larger groups and numbers coming forward being part yeah. of society in ways that, you know, my generation has sort of may have stuck their nose to a little bit <laughs> more to or whatever. But mm -hmm. this is part of, I think, yeah. what I can see, sort of a, a wonderful trend that also that, that's there and that Safe Harbor is tapping into this in the participation it's getting in its programs, the number of kids that are involved and parents and other things. Uh, so mm -hmm. I just want to highlight those numbers if you don't mind. Thank you, yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and they're very enthusiastic and um, we just had uh, intergenerational game night this evening mm -hmm. at right. Wilco yeah. Commons. Children of all Monday night. <laughs> oh, screen agers? Yeah. We'll get into it. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, but they, they are, they're very enthusiastic and they're always coming up with additional feedback and input on what they would like to see differently. So. Mm -hmm. um, it is completely tailored to the youth, and it's youth facilitated. And two of them, um, of our youth leaders, are actually on the state leadership team for the 84. Oh, yeah, so they were they were key players in that whole tobacco law mm -hmm. change. Um, and they meet every Sunday, and they're working towards more tobacco laws, and mm -hmm. um, and they're super enthusiastic about it. And I've seen change in those two particular youth leaders just mm -hmm. in their leadership skills mm -hmm. and their self-confidence so it's nice to see um there are four um, <laughs> national honor society students that are also very active so we're happy with the youth involvement we hit that mark um and then for the active parent involvement or adult involvement we've gone from seven to eighteen and the reason that we've, rec or the way that we've recruited to get those additional yeah. members um, is through our Guiding Good Choices workshops mm -hmm. and PSO, and then the parents of the youth ambassadors. So those parents have seen kind of the change in their <coughs> child and they're believing in what we're doing and they want to be involved as well. So that's really nice to see. Um, and that goes to Screen Ages last night. I think all of our volunteers were parents of youth ambassadors. So. Wow. So it's coming back full circle. And how many people did you have? We had 150. That's wow. amazing. Yeah. That's astounding. That's so and great. And yeah. When wow. we started, uh, I, I can't credit Nicole and Chris enough for what they've done. Oh, great. But when this started, we would draw 25. Mm -hmm. If we, were, if you were lucky. If we were, if you were lucky. lucky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With the programming that we put, yeah. we're putting forward. But that comes back so to the whole community. Well, it's, it's, it's you and Chris and, and being involved yeah. in, in the community and, and getting getting these mm -hmm. accomplishments, especially think, the youth yeah. ambassadors. I think that is so makes. important. Yeah. That peer yes. visibility that Absolutely. we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. And it's good for us. You know, it's a it spreads. Mm -hmm. so yeah. It's a very, very good thing for the community. Mm -hmm. And the success of it so is just... I, Congratulations. Congratulations.
the, the climate has changed. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think you can take some credit and some of the people at Safe Harbor, the leadership can take some credit for hard work when nobody thought that you would make any significant headway in that hard work and there's a whole different mm -hmm. climate. And our kids, thank you. Thank you. Well, but the schools are participating, mm -hmm. and the, yep. the town is yep. participating. Yep. Everybody's it's getting a good the message. snowball. Yeah, all hands on deck. Absolutely, and it's, yep. and it's growing. It, it's really, really becoming a community mm -hmm. that's looking to prevent mm -hmm. substance abuse. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't want to get into your president because you may be talking. You may be going to talk about the coalition meetings that I've been mm -hmm. to the last several of them, and. Um, so I'm impressed by, first of all, with respect to the school, the coalition meetings are meetings for the whole general community and anybody who wants to be involved to help they're well publicized, they put in the paper and on Facebook and so forth. I so I highly recommend anybody come and just learn and see because that's what we're all doing and mm -hmm. it's amazing. But so to key off on what Peter was saying, at the last one, which was the same as the one before, the superintendent of the schools was there. The uh, principal at the, one of the high schools, principal of the junior high school. Mm -hmm. There was another um, a member of the administration that was there that deals with youth. At least those four. Uh, two the members director of, was there. Yeah. Two members of the police department. Numerous citizens, a number of citizens, and the presentations that were made have been so enlightening for me to listen to, and I'm sure for everybody as to what's going on in the world and how it's being addressed, it's absolutely astounding mm -hmm. because this is phenomenal in our community. It's also going on in other communities too, which we're networking out and learning from. Mm -hmm. So that's another example these, that you can see through those coalition meetings and how well attended and how substantive that, that those uh, meetings are. It's, yeah. uh, it's really, it's really good. Thank you, and those coalition mm -hmm. meetings are helpful for us, when I say us, Chris Collar and the project coordinator and myself, just because we aren't members of the community and we're kind of tunnel vision when it comes down to the grant. So it's nice to have that perspective from the police and the schools and the students and the parents that come um, so that we can kind of branch out and be like, okay, maybe we can kind of shift what we're doing. Right. Um, and at the end of the day, that's what a coalition is. It's yeah. not two people, it's the community. So they have been really, really helpful in the last one in particular, which was televised. We're now on cable TV. Oh, yeah, and those meetings are now being televised yeah. on Channel yeah. 9. I on remember Channel you said that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. so if you can't make those meetings, we will be going forward. Are they rebroadcast on 143? They will be, yep, after um, he does that. That was my question. Yeah, people mm -hmm. would love to have that too. Yeah, yeah. and if you go on to safeharborcohasset.org. Mm -hmm. um, we put all of our agendas on there, mm -hmm. but also the minutes. So going forward, there will be minutes in addition to the recordings. So Great. people can check it out. Going off of the coalition member satisfaction, we're trying to bring more training to the coalition meetings. So um, in October, we kicked off this year with um, Health Resource in Action. They came and did some type of coalition capacity building, which is really helpful, um, kind of gauging where are we um, seeing some gaps in what we're doing and who's missing from the table. Um, so we're trying to give and offer more trainings to our youth, our parents, but also the coalition members. Um, and so goal two was to reduce youth substance use. Um, and so this data comes from the YRBS that the schools implement and administer. So every <coughs> two years we partner with them. So 2017 was the last one and then um, what that we're comparing it to. And then April, 2019, we administered and got this data. So that is where the evaluator could compare and see how we're progressing. Um, and this goal is also broken down into four objectives. So that first objective, reduce 30-day use of alcohol by teens ages 14 to 17. Our goal was to get from 33 to 31%. Um, and from the data, we've actually surpassed that goal and got to 29%, wow. um, which is really, um, that's huge. Yeah. I can't say that that's all from Safe Harbor. There's no data to show if it's all what Safe Harbor is doing, but it's, again, the community culture and the norms are kind of shifting. Um, number two was to reduce the past 30 day use of marijuana by the same age group. By 2% was the goal, we, we got down by 1%, so we're at 19%. Um, and this was, any type of decrease was um, a huge achievement for us because of legalization. So right. we were happy with any type of, whether it stayed stable or decreased. So we saw that as a, a an achievement and a win. Yes. Um, 
to reduce the past 30 day use of non-personally prescribed drugs by teens of that same age group by 1%. We, we hit that mark, 3% to 2%. Um, though that's a very small number, this is a very small population <coughs> in Cohasset, and even more so with 14 to 17 year olds in the school. So 2%, you might look at it and say, well, that's it doesn't seem to be a concern, but the fact that 2% of those kids are still engaging in um, misusing those personally prescribed drugs yeah. is an issue. Yeah, that's an issue. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so the last one is to increase the perception of parental disapproval. Um, in this, in mm. some substances we did hit, and in other substances we did not. Interesting. Mm -hmm. is, is there anything there on the peer-related perception of disapproval? Yes. Um, huh. And so that that is interesting to see, and I have that. I've only brought slides for alcohol and marijuana, um, but the vaping. Yeah, it's that group as well. Yeah. Yeah. So there are, although we've we've had great successes with these percentages, there's also areas of concern that come out of for alcohol. For example, as you'll see in the next slide, is the driving, and drinking and driving. Mm -hmm. um, this all comes from that data again. Twelve percent of Cohasset High Schoolers said that they rode with a driver who had been under the influence, yeah. and then four percent of those were them themselves wow. driving under the influence. Um, and again, this is just April 2019. So although we've had a success with decreasing the number who have engaged in the past month with using alcohol, we still have a, a concerning percentage that wow. are drinking and driving. Um, and then we wanted to ask yeah. where where are they getting the alcohol if they, of that 29%? Um, and the biggest percentage, you can't really see it up there, but 35% got it from a friend. So we wanted to tease out where where is that friend getting it from. So the next slide shows um, that a big percent is from their family member who is over 21. Um, and here, I think it's about, if I'm not mistaken, it's about 15% on this slide, so they got it from a family member over 21. And then the next slide shows that the, where they got it from their friend, um, 20, 21% is getting it from a family member over 21. So that's a concern right there. And that's not necessarily just parents. That can be a sibling over 21. That can be... And it, um, mm -hmm. aunt, uncle, cousin. So we are developing focus groups to kind of tease mm -hmm. that out a little more to see where we need to target it. The next big percentage on here, though, is they bought it themselves with a fake ID. Yeah, so 28%. Oh, wow. 28 yeah. with a fake ID. So if you combine 28 wow. and 14, which yeah. bought it themselves. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so... We have a lot of work to do there. Um, the next <coughs> the next one is house rules. So these were questions about what are the rules in their house um, when they discuss it with their parents. 39% discuss um, rules around drinking with their parents, whether you know they knew what, <coughs> their, what their parents thought about drinking and then what the consequences were, would be. So we have about 61% who have not had that conversation with their parent. Um, and then these are more stats. The very last one that you'll see is 13% that their parents said they are allowed to drink, uh, allowed to drink, excuse me, without their parents present, as long as they promised there was no driving involved. Um, so we will be taking this data and targeting our efforts going forward, and how can we make um, <coughs> successes um, and bigger impacts? The perception of risk, like we said, 34% said that they don't think that their parents would think it's wrong for them to drink one or two times a week or a month. Excuse me, um, and 63% don't believe their friends would think it was wrong. So right there, we have this sense of approval um, from their peers and their parents that if they were to drink once or twice a month, it's fine. Um, so we're going to be working as a coalition to target that and hope to um, increase the perception of approval or disapproval. Um, and then 14% don't believe that their parents would think it's wrong if they use marijuana. And 53% don't believe their friends would think it's wrong. Um, so again, we have this sense of approval and that it's okay that we're hoping to mitigate. At what age group is this? This is just the 9th <coughs> 12th grade. Mm. 9th through 12th grade. The, the interesting thing here is that the, um, the approval on the alcohol. Exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. Not to say one's better than the other, right? Mm -hmm. Except marijuana is legal and um, alcohol Creates is a lot of confusion. so destructive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Wow. 
Um, so then you'll see, I won't go through all the stuff here, but I did want to let you take a quick glimpse at it. Um, marijuana use, like you said, it has went down just the percentage. And we saw that there were concerns just that it went up with currently used in the past 30 days. Um, and the synthetic marijuana has gone up drastically and um, those who are using have used on school property at least once in the past month. Just as a thing too, I'm probably most of sure you will know this, but compared to say 20, 25 years ago, mm -hmm. the strength of marijuana has gone from, it has, it has increased by four or five times, four or five hundred percent. Yep, it's drastically so that it, it's, it's a much more powerful drug than mm -hmm. Some of them, you know. And that comes down to technology too, how they can extract <coughs> these, and then the edibles, serving sizes, right. you don't know. Um, it's so it's a much different drug in a ball game, and, mm -hmm. and it's part of the, uh, just a, you know, it's it's a, a fact that really surprised uh, a number of people when you saw it. Yeah. Um, the vaping, as you can imagine, went up drastically, so 26% um, <coughs> said that they had vaped in the past month compared to 18% in 2017. Um, and 19% said that they were having trouble stopping. Mm -hmm. um, we're hoping that these numbers do decrease when we get to 2021 because of the ban and um, a lot of the bylaws and laws that are, are taking place. Um, the biggest concern for me with this was the THC. We went from 12 to 22% of those vaping THC from 2017 to 2019. And that comes back to marijuana. Um, well, that's all black market. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So we will be addressing that going forward as well. And then lastly is the prescription drugs. As we said, it went down um, 1%, um, but you can see an increase with the Xanax, Klonopin, <coughs> that area. So um, we will be addressing that along with the mixing with alcohol. That seems to be something that's occurring that we'll want to address that isn't currently in our action plan. So going into year four, we're going to be adding that. Um, so that's where we're at. We have made significant progress, but we always know that there's room for more. Um, the way that we've done this is through, the next slide is very ugly. You do not have to read it. Um, I tried to list off everything that we've done just in the past um, 20 months, and that doesn't even touch the surface. But these are some of our meetings. We've had over 40 meetings for these ambassadors um, several coalition meetings, <coughs> and then several community events and um, awareness projects. So the next slides are more pretty. Um, one of those projects that the youth have done, um, we've done four sticker shops at Curtis Liquors. They've been a great partner. Um, every sticker, the youth, they design themselves. They come up with the message, they come up with the design, and then they go in and stick about 20, not 20,000, 2,000 stickers each time they go in onto um, Liquor, you know, onto the bottles, yep. onto the cases of beer. Onto alcohol that they feel mm -hmm. their peers would be. And if you look at the counter, the stickers, there's a sticker right on the counter at Curtis. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, they're very great supporters. Um, the next one is National Prevention Week, so that was our community-wide awareness campaign, um, and that one was very successful, the amount of people that got involved. Mm -hmm. We're very, very pleased. Um, we've gone into Deer Hill twice now. We're going into Osgood January 29th to do a Samantha Skunk skit. So the two presentations you see here, one was on mental health <coughs> and healthy coping skills. The other one was Red Ribbon Week and how to say yes to things like going outside or trying to get away from the things <coughs> and don't do drugs because we know that that doesn't work. Um, the more positive social norming. Samantha Skunk is a skit for pre-K through two and they literally dress up. There's a picture somewhere in here. Um, they dress up as a skunk that took medicine from her mom's medicine cabinet and turns green and it starts a conversation about how you shouldn't take medicine that isn't yours um, and it starts a conversation for younger and younger grades mm -hmm. so we have five middle schoolers that will be going into the Osgood to do the skit um, because that and just to <coughs> you know come back to why we're doing more and more younger that's feedback from our community members they want the conversation to start earlier um, and then up here is just snippets from things that we have done. Got a good choices. Um, we bought the rights to a talking with your college student about alcohol if they're going off to college. Um, screenagers, like we just had, we've brought that twice. Um, sober tailgates, which have been successful. The first one was not, to be very honest. Second one was. Um, 
And then coming soon, the next slide, these are what we have coming up. So the ground level cafe, we still average about 60 <coughs> students once a month. Um, we're trying to ramp up our alternative Friday evenings. So we have movie nights at Second Congregational, and then our monthly parent coffee hours have been very successful. The first one had no one, um, and now we're up to about a steady 13 parents that pop in right. once a month, um, and it's just a, an hour. Seabird provides all the coffee for free, um, and parents can just come in if they're having an issue with a, a child or if they just want some advice from their peers. And Allison Bryan, who's an LMHC, mm -hmm. facilitates that whole hour. So it's been, it's been really good, and then you can see our Samantha Skunk kids um lenny's hideaway we are trying to do a saturday alternative hmm. event so that's an open mic for 18 and younger and they will provide free appetizers and whatnot. so right, we are trying um the last feedback that we got was we want to engage the private school sector as well um we have a good proportion of students that don't go to cohabit public schools, they go to private schools, um, and that came up at the last coalition that meeting. From the last coalition. So we do have one student on our youth ambassador's arm that does go to a private school, so we're, she gave some really good feedback, and then um, also getting the social host law out to more of the community members, and um, I think that was right, right around everything that we were trying to do, again, addressing our vaping and um, our high percentages with the alcohol perception of risk. I think also in the last town meeting, the 7,500 that was allocated, you had made, you had discussed using that. And yes. Then you could elucidate the public as to what you know, yep. that's going to be useful. Yep. So, um, thank you, because that was on my to do to mention. Um, so, those funds have, they sponsored uh, self care Saturdays. So, that hits. Mm -hmm. A whole another population um, that's at the library so they made face masks um, it's more about mindfulness and yeah. mental health so the funds that were allocated from the town I have no say in it it's the coalition um, and that is to be used for under the age of 12 over the age of 17 or anything that falls outside of our, our grant funding um, so screen acres because that falls out of our action plan more mental health space because that's an underlying risk for substance use um, and we plan to purchase the Samantha Skunk costumes from Dover UC Youth um, pending how the January 29th event goes so those will be those funds will be used for that okay a thorough yeah. Yeah. Excellent yeah. presentation. Yeah. Uh, Paul. Um, so this is kind of right down my alley. That's what I was uh, going to mention. But a couple things. One, <coughs> I see a patient who's going to have a hip or knee or a joint or something's done. I always tell them, don't let anyone know you're going in for surgery except for the immediate family because mm -hmm. they'll be given pain meds. And mm -hmm. their son or their nephew will have a friend who will have a one. So when they take the copies of the pain meds that are, that are prescribed. So that's one thing to uh, focus on. Who knows? You may need to tell people, but you may not need to tell the neighborhood. Yep. Uh, the, the vaping we saw at South Shore, it's, there's a lot of it that is, it, you know, it reminds me when I was young, there was a parent plot that was used for the herbicide for marijuana to kill it. The trouble is they would still harvest it and sell it, and it was toxic to the lungs. It, there's something in the vaping that is just extraordinarily strong and dangerous and toxic to the lungs, regardless of yeah. which one you pick, but it seems to be the black market ones are, are, are worse. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, looking at when they say the addiction, you can see once they start the vaping, it's exceedingly addictive. Yeah. <coughs> so they're trying to stop it, as you saw, they, <coughs> once they start, it's very difficult to stop because of its addictive potential. Um, and then going back to what you have to, what you call it, I think Iceland calls it secondary engagement, where Iceland's not a huge country, 300,000 people, and I think of it as basically downtown Boston. But they have a heavy alcohol problem, and what they did was they used a, a secondary engagement, so they got people involved with, like, the alcohol-free tailgating. They got into organizations and activities that did not have alcohol involved, and they saw an incredible drop in 
on the road deaths from alcohol, uh, alcohol yep. poisoning, you know, accidents, you know, fall down, uh, alcohol intoxication uh, mm -hmm. in just the public health sector, and it's it works. Yeah, so it's you, also you know, you think, well, mm -hmm. cultural norms, up yeah. against a big, you know, a big problem. But you know, simple things where you just get engagement outside of alcohol and having a party mm -hmm. um, works. So that's kind of the, the background, which I think is great. What you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, and coming back to the V thing, um, you know, I tell the kids a lot of the chemicals or the flavorings that are in the vaping, the vapings, the vapor. Um, have been FDA approved for ingestion, you know, right. if it's butter flavored or whatever, but they have not been FDA approved to go into your lungs. And our right. lungs are so sensitive mm -hmm. to begin with. So um, that's where we are seeing all of those issues right. and unfortunate deaths. Um, luckily, I don't think any in Massachusetts were used. Mm -hmm. Nothing. One. Yeah, I actually said that. I was like, I think that's wrong, but yeah. There, the vaping problem is so out of control on the college level, and I see it, and I talk to my students about it, and a lot of them have said that they got addicted in high school and that they weren't even aware that it was addictive. And it's scary the way that, you know, Philip Morris, who owns Juul, has done brilliant marketing to hide all of this. And it's just, we see it so much at a lot of the colleges in Boston and around Mass, and a lot of it's happening in high school, so thank you for addressing that because it is a problem that has gotten more and more out of control. Yeah. I can say personally, my friend group, yep. it's the 20 to 30 year olds mm -hmm. that then, it's like they can't put it away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they can't they, even they take can't. it. They have it in class. They have yeah. to hold on to it. It's, it's really it's scary how yeah. addictive it is. And it's like double edged because the, the whatever they're vaping is addictive, right. but mm -hmm. the, the the press, I mean, I yeah. chew on yeah. my pens, yeah. right? Exactly. And, like, it's very hard for me not to chew on It's an oral fixation thing. So there's, yeah. there's that just keeping them busy, so there, that's where <coughs> the mental health and mm -hmm. yeah, the all the kind of the Even the tobacco ones, the potency yeah. is very <coughs> right. It's, it's yeah. multiples of a pack of cigarettes if you do a whole <coughs> capsule. Yeah. You get, like, double addictions. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I particularly like your putting up the <coughs> negative and then the positive on the other side because we focus on all the negative but you, you, the one good way and I like the way that you gave us those statistics because they're very helpful to have an alternative mm -hmm. to have something mm -hmm. where the kids have something to do whether you know promoting the teen center that's on it I know in town or just a hundred percent before that so our children and our kids and our young adults have something more positive have a focus of something like that. And I really congratulate you on the work you're doing. It's an excellent job. Anything else? So thank you very much. Good thank thorough you. quality and further progress. And thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> this is a triple header. You got a triple header. Yeah. 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 You used to play hockey. What do they call it? A hat trick? Hat trick. Right. I did used to play hockey. I know you did. Uh, okay. The next item on the agenda uh, uh, is the licenses and permits. We have the MS Walk and the Earth Day. Uh, since we have the Earth Day person here right now, we'll cover that first. Uh, should we introduce yourself? Peter Pescatori, I'm chair of the Open Space Committee. And the Open Space Committee, in conjunction with the town, sponsors the Earth Day uh, observance. Uh, this will be our second annual, and it's also the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Oh, wow. um, I have met, I've, I've you know, submitted my application. And I met with the uh, event group, event approval committee, um, to talk over the MS Walk, which is the same day. And, uh, nobody thinks there's any problem with how each one operates. The walk happens. And the, the Earth Day thing, we, you know, people, we dispatch people to all the corners <coughs> of the, the town yeah. to clean up, so there's never, there's never a mass of people any place that can bump into each other. So, so that's, uh, so we, they recommended that we could go forward with that. Um, this year we're essentially doing the same, we're adding a couple of things a little different, but it'll be essentially the same, we'll be having a couple of dumpsters put out in the back of the uh, parking lot over the weekend from Saturday. They'll be picked up early Sunday, uh, Monday morning. 
Uh, we'll set up right in front of the town hall on the grass, a couple of tables, and that's pretty much it. Um, you know, people will come up, uh, we'll have t-shirts, uh, you know, we'll give them directions on where to go and how to, uh, how to conduct the cleanup, you know, what not to do, you know, stay, stay out of the street, you know, don't go in the water, don't touch any wires, things like that, don't go on 3A, you know, we'll ha we have a whole checklist of, you know, what training, training things, uh, everybody will get one. Um, the town is going to supply the bags again, I think, and uh, the dump truck and the crew probably. Uh, worked really well last year. Um, this will be the second annual, and I hope it you know becomes a tradition in the town. Um, it's a good time. You know, it's obviously we have a two hundred fiftieth celebration coming up. It's April is a great time to get the town cleaned up as best we can, and in preparation for that. So. And the date is April 25th to It's the 25th, yeah, the actual celebration, the actual birthday is the 22nd, it's a Wednesday, uh, to conduct a big, you know, during the week, so right. we move it to the end of the week, it's uh, school, it's the end of school vacation, so that's a bit of a problem, but to put it off, you know, into another week, you yeah, know, and, you get, uh, right. you know, you get away from the event. Yeah, just the whole the world is celebrating, you know. Yeah, it is, right. actually, right. Yeah, there yeah. is a national group. You yeah, know, okay. sent the, the flyer around. Well, also, last year we did uh, four educational programs at different venues around town uh, all during that week, and one spilled over to the next weekend. I think we'll do two this year. One, uh, one there's a movie, uh, uh, environmental, uh, climate change oriented movie that I'm going to watch next week. To see if it's appropriate, and then uh, we'll get a speaker to talk about climate change. That's the theme of the 50th birthday uh, observance: is climate change. So, very appropriate. Good, Diane. Just, just something for you to consider, and I, um, which is maybe not having a T-shirt because textile recycling is a huge issue, and it's a huge issue vis-a-vis -vis the climate. Just putting it out there. I know people like the giveaway, but those of us that have closets full of just t-shirts from activities or road mm. races or whatever. Um, I don't know, there might be something else. Just throwing it out there for your consideration. Well, the meeting is tomorrow night. The first, uh, the organization meeting is tomorrow night at 5.30 in the basement. Okay. So, um, I'll stop by and give us it. your advice. I might be able and, to. Uh, you know, we'll, uh, and again, it's a very democratic group, I hope. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we don't the intention uh, is <laughs> so okay. Yeah, we'll, yeah. Be, we'll be, you know, assigning people to subcommittees for various activities and you know, all come back together on the 25th. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, so oh, one other thing the school is already, we already <laughs> talked to the school, and uh, they are going to be doing the art again this year, okay. which will be climate change yeah, theme. Good. And they're Great going theme. to, uh, I think they're going to approve. Uh, Community service hours for good. any of the high middle school, high school mm -hmm. kids who participate, which good. would be great. You know, we get some kids out that are around. Mm -hmm. Paul, uh, the last year I specifically drove down North Main Street because I knew that was probably where most of them mm -hmm. were left. Pickles like that. The day before and then a couple of days after, and it was remarkable how clean it was afterwards. Mm -hmm. It was just oh, that delight. That yeah. crew, that rotary you crew. included, yep. and, and the same did thing a, going down Sawyer Street. This did a fabulous job. I have yeah. scars at the bottom from of Sawyer Street, Street down by, by 3A. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I, I noticed it all over town. You know, yeah. it, was, it was just a delight to drive home yeah. and not have travel. Well, that's mm -hmm. that, that is the yeah. idea. The, the red magazine yeah. rack that was just poking up out of the wow. And, yeah. and the, you know, and the other thing was the original Earth Day was really a local thing that. Became national, Group, became yeah. worldwide, and it was even before the, the U.S. EPA was even organized. Yeah. So it, it was the impetus to get the <coughs> EPA to say, you know what, yeah. we don't want yeah the three A trash and urban you know, burn. You drive talking about driving around, you, you probably notice all the trash along three A. We can't. Yeah. It, we, you know, our people. You know, when we do this, we can't go out there at all because it's state prop. You know, it's a state's problem, right? And it's too dangerous to be up on three A. Yeah. So, that's one of the prohibitions that we have. Mm -hmm. So, uh, also do just from memory, I remember this was another one of those events where there was much larger participation, I think, than 
It really was quite a it was the best turnout last year. Last year. Turnout. Yeah. So that was. And of course, we'll we'll do the same we'll you know the promotional way. scheme that we did last year. Yeah. You know, social media. We'll have mm -hmm. flyers. We'll All the stuff. Yeah. Lawn signs yeah. And so it really was a really big success. Yeah. I look forward to it being a big success again. Any other comments? What time is it starting again? Same time as last year. Starts at year. nine. Okay. Uh, we hand out. Whatever we're going to hand out from nine to two thirty bags, you know, people have to come, sign up, get a, yeah. get an assignment. You know, we try to keep track of how many people okay. we set where, so you know, people have actual some work to do. One of the things we're going to focus on is graffiti. We've done a lot of graffiti and and uh, back behind the dam and up up in Wheelwright, and you know, working with Chris to figure out what materials to use and, mm -hmm. you know, appropriate so that, uh, you know, that isn't too costly but does the job and who we can, uh, who we can do, who, who we can get to do that. Chris, did you want Yeah, this is the way we started off uh, in my prior community when I was a, a number of years back. And, and we started off small and it's become a, 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 a great part of the community tradition. This guy was really big. Um, and it's something we talked about when I first got here and it just, it needed the right group of folks to kind of coalesce around and I want to thank Peter and this the whole group that's done this because it, it takes a lot of work to pull this off and it, the, the, the impact of it is huge. Everyone can just come and volunteer and there's been folks, we had a, a, some folks who've kind of come to this who've gotten more active on other, on other activities um, and it, it's been a great opportunity so it's, it, it's great to be able to help, uh, you know, catalyze these kind of great activities and yes. get them going. Yeah, and we uh, we do fundraising. We we raise about thirty five hundred dollars to you know cover all of the yeah you know, we have to pay for the dumpsters to for take it away and all that kind of stuff. Good. Okay. Anything else on this? Nope. Peter, thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. Yes, yeah. 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 definitely. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Very, very much appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I move that we approve um, the Earth Day cleanup day, April 25th, 2020, from 9 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. approximately. And Second. Set up in front of the Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. That's unanimous. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank, Thank you, Peter. Good luck. Okay, the next item we have is the MS Walk, uh, 4, 25, 20, same thing. If we have anything in our package, is there anybody here for that? I'm not seeing anybody. Chris, do you want to start off? Yeah, this has been going on for a number of years, um, and it's been successful. It's kind of one of those events that I think our public safety folks have found the science, uh, and it's, uh, uh, okay, what are we up to now? Since the 15th first year, so, um, and it's something that goes on all over the country, so it's, uh, this is our local version. Okay. Yeah. Any questions on this? Yes. Want to make a motion? Sure. A motion to approve the MS walk for April twenty fifth, twenty twenty. As presented to us. In the as package. presented to us in the packet. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Tracy, that's unanimous. Okay. We're on schedule here. Uh, moratorium on Cohasset Harbor commercial permits, trailer parking restrictions. Uh, we have, uh, Chris will be talking on this, but uh, bring your attention to the special proposals that you have in your package. If this is the ones in front of you. These are the ones we'll be considering, okay? So, everybody has that in front of them. If you need a copy, Tracy, you can give it to you. Sure. So everybody should be done. I'll let you know. Just there's, you should have two versions of this in front of you. So uh, the, uh, at the direction of the board. I was going to say, just to set this up for you, yeah, at a previous meeting, we'll do it before, yes, Chris, we discussed this at a board, and we decided that we wanted to initiate, you know, uh, a moratorium uh, in, in the areas that he's talking about in the government island and the uh, mm -hmm. uh, Parker Street area. And we asked Chris to come back to us with uh, a couple of uh, concrete proposals that we could act on and any <coughs> information he wants to give us on us. So that's the setup? Yes, that's the setup. So uh, the, uh, as, 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 ever, as, as uh, everyone is aware, the town has been working on a harbor plan for a couple of years in the valley, and I think the home stretch. Uh, and also, uh, as, as a result of those conversations, we're going to take a look at the town dock, and, <coughs> the, and we're exploring uh, a lift system based on the board's uh, uh, Encouragement and a vote of town meeting fund uh, in the fall. 
So there's a lot of moving pieces, and uh, with the activity that's been going on across the border, that's been moving as well. And, and uh, there's just a, the, the town needs to be able to see what the impacts of this will be on, on the harbor and on the infrastructure. And in order to do that, and, and this all kind of grounds here is the Government Island. So Government Island is, is it's the town dock, it's Parker Avenue, it's boat launch. And um, so I went back, uh, spoke with Special Counsel Lampley, uh, and we, we uh, pulled pull this together. So um, <coughs> there's two options here that will just give the time, allow the town a, time, a little town, allow the town a little time just to continue to get the de plans developed, policies developed, so things could be addressed reasonably and we can you know, deal with potential impacts on our schedule, not just being thrown at the game. Um, the um, one option just affects uh, government island, and government does a government island pass that, uh, that allows part of the town uh, parking and uh, program uh, and access. Uh, the, the broader one and, uh, is not just that, but also to regulate the, the parking of trailers around the harbor. And there's a number of streets that are laid out here. Um, and, and that policy would also allow us to develop a, a parking regulation plan so the town can regulate who can park where. There isn't any really rules. If you're on a public way and you can, and there's legal parking, you're allowed to put a trailer down there. It doesn't happen a lot. The concern is we don't know what will happen. So um, uh, I did talk to Special Counsel Lampy about this, and I think we could t come up with a, with a parking plan uh, for, for trailers uh, by spring. Uh, when this really becomes more of an issue, but this would just kind of lock everything down right now. Because uh, at this point, you know, we the town needs time to develop plans. Yeah. What's going on. I want to let you give Chris a chance to finish your presentation. Do you have anything else? Yeah, so that, that basically what this does is puts a six month more term in place. The selected can most certainly ad address that or adjust that on a case by case basis. So if there's new policies or developments that come up at that time, again, I, I will continue to work with special counsel on this very specific. If the town, if, if the board wants to adopt a restriction on the trailers right now on the streets, um, this would allow uh, us to develop a plan to come back to you later uh, this spring. And, um, you know, as the harbor plan develops and that gets completed and there's more conversation about the lift system, the board can then take more concrete steps. And, and again, if the decision come June, the, the decision, you know, we still need more time to develop, the board can continue to, ex to extend on a reasonable basis. If we wish. If you wish. Oh, okay. And so, in, in summary, then quickly, I mean, I'm quickly, one of these involves just parking around Parker Street and Government Island area, and the other one involves parking plus trailers all around the harbor. All and around and the that's harbor. really literally everything from Harrod Gleason Road wrapped yeah. all the way around. It's um, more extensive, but uh, that won't be such an issue for a few months, and we have a time to look at that if we want to. But we can act on that tonight to put that. Yeah. Those are the two things before us. Is it before us? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and now, Chris, That's it. anybody any comments on this? So, I have a couple questions. Can you describe the government island access permits in the process for that that currently exists and how that might impact? Because I didn't, I wasn't aware. Yeah, there is one. And, okay. and it, so, so it's actually in the, the rules, and it's actually, um, so what happens is someone would, would come to the clerk and ask for one. They cheat, the clerk would validate with the harbor master, uh, because there are, that's generally people who have commercial operations or a, a, an out of town board. <coughs> so, so there are some people who do. Uh, mostly the commercial folks who, you know, uh, work out of town. So th this doesn't affect anyone who's a pre-existing holder of, of, of a permit. You know, someone's renewing a permit. It's okay, but it's going to put a freeze on any no. new ones right. pending an update on. So my question is for a resident because I assumed that my resident sticker. Your all facility sticker will also allow you to park. Well, so st and so that's not going to impact any Cohasset resident. Yeah. At all, all facility stickers are only available to town residents. Mm -hmm. Government Island stickers are available to non residents right. within, a, within a certain limitation on. So the there's like an add on, there's a, a, a mm -hmm. separate sticker for those Correct. exceptions on go for Government Island. And that's parking. generally revolved around people who use the harbor uh, commercially. commercially or. I, I, again, I don't have a long history on who has more and, and not, but uh, okay. it's hard to see. Uh, Diane, do you have another just, point? Just a quick follow-up on that. So assuming there are some commercial fishermen or lobstermen or whatever that have in the past received a government island parking pass, they would still be able to... Renewals are... This renewals. doesn't affect renewals. This only affects new ones. It so doesn't, that's... 
All right. That's clarified. On the issues of new government island access. Right. But are right. they like, if they're an annual pass, one could assume mm -hmm. that new would mean they're 2020? Mm -hmm. That's not the intent. That's not if the intent. you want to word I just want to make sure that we have right. the right intent. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, the intent is just, it, this is not to affect any renewals. If people already have access to one and they continue in their business, uh, under pre-existing terms, then that's okay. And what's the, what is the policy on parking boat permits currently? There's not. There's not. <laughs> uh, so we're saying nobody. Yeah, yeah, at this point, I think we need to come up with a policy um, to yeah. say where they should. We have a, right now, there's seven spaces that park around, right? First come, first serve. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you do have to have <clears> a government island permit for that. Correct. Okay. But on the streets, I mean, I, you know, I, I, it's not like we've seen a lot of these just popping up, yeah. right? That said... We don't know what could happen here, right? So, so the point is just to be proactive, to figure out where we need to be, and then come up with a plan. And, and again, I want to talk to Special Counsel after you do a lot more, do some more research about what's going on, and then come back to the board with a plan. Uh, so yeah. the goal is to protect things from getting bad right. accidentally. Paul. So are, are there fines? So no parking will then entail. There's no parking of trailers. So whatever no the fines are trailers. in our existing policy. Now so we're going to be coming. No parking. Fine. So if you remember, we talked with you quickly last uh, last month. We'll be coming back with a set of new fines. So uh, uh, he wants to raise a bunch of them. So there's also like an unclassified one. So this will probably be, this, will, this will be in that. But we'll look at that as a separate issue. Yeah. Is that right? Because we're looking yeah. at all fines. Yes. Yeah. So, so there, there will be a fine to enforce this. Yes. Okay. Anything else, Paul? No, that's it. Uh, Jack. So um, in the past, I've seen <coughs> trailers with multiple canoes and kayaks parked along. And I could never figure out whether they were parked illegally to begin with or they'd gotten permits. But when you see a big, long trailer that can carry six kayaks, um, I think it's a group from Charles River does that all the time. And how does that impact these people? So that's something I talked with the, the Harbor Master about today. So we don't, <coughs> that's been kind of an unregulated reality. Yeah. Nobody wants to stop kayaking, but I think it, we need to figure out who's doing it and how the town wants to regulate it. So we, that's something that I have to come back to you about before people go into the water. Nobody's going in there. It, Lori told me not until April generally that people start going out. Mm -hmm. but commercially, people can do it privately if they want to. Uh, so uh, we, that's a good point, Jack, and uh, that's mm -hmm. something we talked about. Um, and it's, it's really, it's primarily kayaks as a, a, and as a company or two. And we get, we, we, I think there's a general sense that having people active on the water is great. We just want to make sure we're regulating it too, right? Right. Um, in a reasonable way. Is there any particular reason you have a uh, special counsel man be handling this? Uh, he, he was local and and here, and he's and he worked on things like this before. So it was just it was. So just you appointed him to handle this? I I, I, I I'm talking about him about the issue that we talked about earlier tonight, mm -hmm. and it was just easy because he was there and available. So, so you appointed? I, I asked him to work on this. Okay, so it's so your appointee. Uh, no, the board is appointed a special counsel. I just accessed him as the res the board's assigned me resources. I think the resource I have. Yeah. Um, Anything else? Anything else, Jack? No. Mm -hmm. Jerry? No, I'm good. Okay. So, it seems to me that, you know, one thing I want to say is, is that there's a, there's a lot of what's probably generated this. We, well, we've discussed this at the board level anyway. So there's a lot going on in terms of our harbor plans that are still somewhat in flux and our yeah. master plans and uh, the other issues that are coming up uh, in town with the agricultural possibilities and all those things. And it's created, you know, within our community quite a lot of concern yeah. and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So really the intention of this is, what well, we've discussed this already, is, is to do a six-month moratorium. Mm -hmm. I think that's an appropriate protective measure that this board mm -hmm. will take. And it also makes a statement to our community that we're paying attention to this. And, mm -hmm. we, and it's only six months anyways. Yeah, right. The issue is relative to the trail is a little more tricky, but... I think it's good to go ahead and do that and then have Chris come back in conjunction with right. what he's talking about with the Harbor Master Club to see if there's any tweaking we want to do that so that we don't have any unintended consequences. So it seems like pretty good to me. I see a couple of hands, uh, Paul and Carrie. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the one line of the, uh, the, the, the subject like that, uh, we can come in by uh, way of terminate or extend more term like in a public meeting. I mean, that'll be one way if there is you know, a petition by a uh, commercial kayak <coughs> convention that says we want to bring a right. trailer down, we can always say, mm -hmm. we'll give you a parking sticker for right. the given area. Mm -hmm. So there is, there's a, there's an out, as well as we can make, we can mm -hmm. terminate at any time. But that can be done if we need to, we right. need to do that tonight. Right. Mm -hmm. We can issue it, we can yeah. issue the moratorium and then we can yeah. amend it. Yeah, that's what I'm 
kind of mean. Right. I was, yeah. was going to say that. I know, too. Carrie, go ahead. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was going to say that. And also, so would it begin tonight after we vote on it? or? What you vote on it goes into effect. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> happy <laughs> told you. Such power. <laughs> you know, and, and just, just to add to this, is we can lift it at any time. Right. Mm -hmm. Just to reiterate exactly. that. Yeah. So if we come up with a set of policies before, the, if most people aren't going to be looking for permits to do anything until March when they're available. So it gives us that <laughs> ramp to, to well, set right. some things What we're doing action. is laying a protective uh, this is good timing. moratorium on this. I think it's quite yeah. appropriate for us board to do that. I'd be in favor of a motion on the, uh, the broader one too, by the way. So. Does anybody want to make a motion? Uh, uh, any further oh, well, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Make a motion. I, I move that we uh, enact a moratorium on government island access and permits as per the um, paper that was given to us. Yeah, why don't you read the whole thing? Parking, trails. Okay, parking, okay. Yeah. 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 Moratorium on that? the parking of boat trailers on public ways around the harbor. Effective as meeting. proposed January 14th, 2020, effective Either upon one. adoption. Yeah. So the, the broader one. Mm -hmm. yes. The broader one. Right. It's before I said, sorry. Just for a second. And then for the record, for anyway, this is the actual one, so we know everybody knows what's being passed. Okay, any further discussion? No. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. All right. Uh, so unanimous, Tracy. Please care of that Excuse subject. Me, Mr. Chairman, can you just announce that we're taking off a few things on our agenda because there are people in the audience that are here and yes. they may be here for issues that we're not discussing. Okay, yeah. So there's a couple of items here. Chris, on the first one is the Tree City USA approval of the tree policy. Yeah, so, so Chris, why do we, we need to pull that? Yeah, up? So, so that was actually on an error. It was my, my mistake. Um, I knew Peter was coming and I, I thought we were going to line them up. He reminded me that he was looking for February 11th, but there was still some more work that he wanted to do. The other piece of that is that Council Dorensis is actually going to be looking at the proposed policy, and I've actually forwarded that to him for review. So uh, they'll definitely give him a chance to take a look at it. And I don't think it's anything complicated, but it's just good to have Council check. Uh, so we'll get that back, and then we'll have it for the board. In another meeting or two? Yeah, probably February 11th. I think that's where we're planning that probably. That'll also be in line with the uh, proposal by the Open Space Committee for the town to join Tree City USA. Okay, so let's look to have that on February yeah, 11th. That's, that's okay? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so that won't be covered in fact for those reasons. The other is the uh, all facility sticker rate schedule 2020. So I spoke with uh, DPW Director Brian Joyce today. So there's a, a number of other tweaks they want to make to some R on the RTF. This involves <coughs> the office city stickers, the RTF, and Sandy Beach, and uh, actually also the Island. But um, it's, it's also... Um, uh, it, it linked into that is other regulations that they have under the RTF and another couple of uh, tweaks on some of the other fees and Brian wants to put them together as a package. And I said, okay, I, it, makes more, it, it makes sense to put them in front of the board as a group. Um, I, I will telegraph that the recommendation is to increase if anyone's seen the Boston Globe stories recently about recycling, uh, that's been affecting us for every year. The markets have collapsed. <coughs> uh, now the good news is we were able to reduce our solid waste costs, which have helped mitigate that to some extent, but it's not going to be a long-term solution. So um, we also realize that our fees for these stickers are much lower than our neighbors. Not that that's a reason to raise them, um, but it's one way of, of generating revenue to cover the program, particularly since we're not getting any revenue really at this point for recyclables. We're actually paying for this piece of paper. So we'll get that. If not the 28th, then the 11th as well. Okay. Okay, so that addresses those two items. If anybody's come and didn't realize that we were to apologize uh, that those are the reasons that they're not on the agenda. If someone came on that, I would recognize them. Okay. If you need to identify your, in your name, excuse me, oh, you need to identify your name and, and the address. Susan Davis, 257 Atlantic Ave. Association says that the land is supposed to be maintained for residents of Cohasset. It's very clear from the charter. So, I, in all due respect, I think the board of Sandy Beach Association lost sight of that. Um, 
it's my understanding, don't hold me to the numbers, there are about 220 parking places in the parking lot, and the Sandy Beach Association sells 160 to 180 stickers to out-of-town residents. That means that 78% of the parking places go to out-of-town residents. Anecdotally, the parking lot's full, people can't get in, um, it's on the weekends, they're all Hingham kids there. This is, comes from a friend of mine that teaches in Hingham. Um, they're selling their passes on Hingham yard sale. And those are all anecdotes. But I guess my biggest question is, how can a non-for-profit sell spaces on public property to benefit a non-for-profit? Now, I'm thinking because what we should do is take that in as public comment, and that should be, those are very good and appropriate comments, and they should be taken into the factor when we discuss the sticker issue, is that okay? And that will also give an opportunity for you, Tom Major, to bring this question to the Sandy Beach folks that, so that when this comes up, they have an opportunity to address it, okay? So that's the way we'll take that in. And, and they'll hear it, see it, and address that, and then we'll have to deliberate on it as a board. And that one, to the extent that you can, Chris, you know, be prepared to brief us on what our what our rights and regulations are, we may have to have the council here for that discussion because it's an important one. Yeah. Okay? That's just the way we'll handle of, that. Just a point of information. <coughs> I just speak to Sandy Beach and your 160, 70 figures is accurate according to Sandy Okay. We'll just a point of information. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. That's the way we'll deal with that. Okay? Yeah. And uh, thank you as a citizen for coming forward. We always appreciate comments and we'll react to it that way. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Nice to see you this evening. Okay, um, anything else then on the sticker issues? All right, we're mishmashing around here. I think I'm out of, um, there's something here where town manager update. No, you're up to the, you have to open the warrant. Oh, we got to open the warrant. Minor detail. It's minor detail. Minor detail. Minor detail. Minor. <laughs> Otherwise, we don't have a town meeting. But <laughs> uh, all right, need a motion to just simply to open so, up the warrant. Why don't you give the legal to the public right, notice so, so, you know, um, what the implications are of what we're doing? While the bylaw, uh, Town bylaw is very explicit about how the, the window for citizen petitions opens. It's always good practice to formally open the warrant. We've been soliciting internally and from committees uh, interest in warrant articles for a month. In fact, that deadline is supposed to close Friday. So I have some idea of what people are looking to do. <coughs> I've spoken with Kerry, among others, about uh, particular articles. Yeah. And um, those other, we're going to kind of pull those together and kind of sketch out a, a kind of warrant and then. We'll start to work through that. The citizen's petition window actually opens now, and I don't have the date in front of me, but it closes in February. So, but you're formally open, opening the warrant tonight, and I'll start actually building a warrant, and we'll talk in a couple of weeks about where we, what we're looking like. And then in early February, you'll have a little bit tighter warrant with the potential citizens. And we begin to look at drafts of it for the new members, and that's what mm -hmm. that ultimately will lead to our production of them. A warrant for the town, which is one of the very main functions of the board of selectmen, is that we develop and present the warrant. So it's one of our, this is our you now in the major league responsibilities here. Yeah, we got real work. This is what we're set up for 300 years from now. Yeah. Okay, anything else? I just have a question about do, do, we, do we know a date or an approximate for citizens' petitions? Yeah, I, I, I uh, is on the, oh, you yeah, I can do it. Yeah. We have a, I, I don't have the, the schedule in front of me. Uh, I just think it's probably important to yeah, get that yeah, out there. I, I, um, so what we also do is we schedule stick. council. We've had the last few years council directors come in to be able to talk to anyone who wants to file a citizen's petition to kind of help, you know, it, to, to, to explain what can work and can't. And it doesn't draft them for them. It kind of gives them some thoughts, and that's been very successful. We're going to usually set that up for at the end of January, early February, and we'll announce a date. We usually do it on a Tuesday night, but be, you know, so that we're here late anyway. Is that on? That should be on then, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> so the deadline for citizen petitions is February 19th. Okay, so for anybody who's listening, up, any citizens that want to make petitions, it's your democratic right to do so. We encourage that. You have to have it in by February 19th. If you need assistance on it, contact the town manager's office. 
We will also provide you with legal assistance. We set up that program a few years ago to help you want your warrant out. So we encourage your participation. February 19th is the date. Mm, thank you. And obviously getting in an earlier than that is helpful. Much earlier It's than actually a better. form. Because they have to be phrased, um, uh, they have to be phrased correctly, and as too often I've seen a good intended citizen's petition gets developed, but it's not phrased in such a way. It gets to the town, and if it hasn't been reviewed by our attorney, it can get to the town floor, and the moderator might rule it out of line, or the town attorney. Can. So it's important that you follow that process carefully, as we have to do. But you're welcome to participate on it. It's grassroots, like you see in few democracies even in this country, so take advantage of it if you want. And there is a form online for this, there's a citizen petition mm -hmm. format which helps people structure them. See, and, I like this. Uh, it's online, <laughs> yeah. and if you wanted a hard copy, oh, I'm yeah. trying to get from this office, but they're online. We're going to have an updated ATM 2020 page. Uh, if, it's not, if it's not already done, then it's, it's, it's up there. It's, it's up, up there yep. already. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but this, this, the schedule's up there, and I think that form's already up there as well. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay. So if you, someone wants to... So I'm going to uh, make a motion that the bill is over the one this year. We'll so I move. Why well, won't you articulate it? I, <laughs> oh, it's just getting complicated. Huh? <laughs> uh, I move that we open the uh, uh, the warrant for the 2020 town meeting. What's the date you're opening it for? 5-4-2020. Okay, second. second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nays. It's unanimous. Okay. Warrant is now open. Yeah. Okay, the next uh, item, unless I have a bit of a mishmash here, would be the town manager update. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Chris Seymour. So, so uh, yeah, no, this right. actually fits uh, kind of nicely with the conversation about affordable housing earlier tonight. So, um, and this is a little bit of a complicated conversation, uh, and Kevin has asked to me to start briefing because you'll hear this more formally in two weeks and hopefully uh, a draft warrant article for consideration. <coughs> If not <coughs> later in January than early February, uh, so uh, this is a stop and shop part. So if anybody, if you want to just take a copy of this map, this is just a lot I think give people perspective is what we're talking about. Um, and turn it, and just turn it so that the legends at the bottom. Um, I think we know it's by heart. Um, that's just a copy for the record. So. Um, so if you look at the, um, where it says Deer Hill, so right in front of that is, uh, it's not really, I guess that's technically Deer Hill, but that's actually the, um, the um, Crooked State. Yes, thank you. Uh, and in front of that is um, the Stop and Show Plaza. So the little gray building to the left is 380, that's where Feng Shui, among other things, is. Mm -hmm. uh, the middle building is, not, is, is to be constructed, and the one on the right is Stop and Show, those gray buildings. Um, so what's the black one there? The black one? Um, I believe that's a pre I think that's a sewage. Uh, I think sewage pump that, station. That, that's a proposed pump station for the. So I'll, get, I'll be getting to that in just a second. So first, just <coughs> that middle building that you see that's been permitted. Uh, it's been approved by the zoning board and the planning board as a mixed use structure. And the most important aspect of that for all of us tonight is the twenty. The second floor would be twenty affordable housing units rentals. Five would be permanently needed, so a quarter of the units have to be permanently affordable, and all of the twenty count. So as I think Rob was referring to, there's the hard twenty, right. or, or, and the other ones that count, even though they're not necessarily affordable. So, uh, but that would, those twenty would go a long way towards the town's meeting its its numbers. Uh, so what would be the total number of in that building? Twenty. And they will all go to affordable. They would all count as affordable. Five would be permanently set aside, one quarter of them as affordable, and then the other 15 would count because they went to us. That's yeah. the way it works. So that's a big contribution to our mm -hmm. affordable housing. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and again, affordable. so when this was actually first proposed a couple of years ago, uh, the chairman of the planning board came to me and said, We really got to look at this uh, as an affordable unit. We found some money. We brought an affordable housing consultant on who worked with the zoning board when the approvals came to, to make sure this was structured in such a way that. that, that the approvals would lead to a big A affordable housing, as, as Rob was pointing out before. Uh, so, what's going to what has to happen now to, to, to continue that process is a plan has been developed by an affordable housing consultant uh, retained by the owner of this. Uh, the, this <coughs> um, the same consultant, I think, the work <coughs> called work with the town on the um, the uh, plan unit development site down at the train station. That affordable housing piece. Uh, and that plan <coughs> has been pulled together. It's going to be presented to the Affordable Housing Trust at their next meeting, and the Affordable Housing Trust needs to sign off on that plan for, for the affordable housing. And then it's going to come to the Board of Selectmen on the 20th. The plan is to have it to the Board of Selectmen on the 28th, so you'll be presented with the plan. 
and then the board needs to say yes or no. And this, and it, again, if everything has come together like it should, it should be fine. Then the board has to ratify it and say this is what the community endorses this. Um, this these, and this is what we we approved, and then it goes off the DHC. So when we were to do that approval, that approval is as affordable housing. Is that yes? Absolutely. We're familiar with everything. So I mean, I know just off the top, and we've discussed this already. But if we were to do such an approval, I myself would want to make sure that, that that's the, the issue of whether those twenty units can be affordable housing is over. We're yeah. not. I don't mm -hmm. want any because I've seen it before in this town and elsewhere. And then you come back later saying, well, gee, when the numbers don't work, I want ten of them. Not blah blah blah. I, if we're to give our approval, that needs to be ironclad that we're approving only as affordable housing. Is that, I mean, at least a, I'm just yeah, saying. So, so, so the zoning board's decision requires them to be DHC be affordable, and the planning board ratify the same condition. Mm -hmm. So what the, what, the, what the Affordable Housing Trust and the Select are doing is saying, yes, this is actually such a thing, uh, and you'll get that proposal, and then, it, then, you, then you say to DHCP, yes, you could please look at these. these, these they fit the intent that was approved. Uh, and the, and then they say then then it goes to the DHCD process. So as long as the town's good with it, mm -hmm. the DHCD generally says yes, we're good. And then what ha will happen once the buildings are built? And I'm leaping ahead. When the COs are issued, they become counted towards our stock. Mm -hmm. Normally in a 40B process, the minute they're approved, they get counted because this is this is not really a friendly 40B. It's a little different than that. Um, and and I, please forgive me for the acronyms. Lauren knows them much better than I. Um, but these count, these will all officially, all these will officially count. So that's the affordable housing piece to this. Does anyone have any questions for me? Diane uh, and then I, Jack. Just a clarification, which, which is that while all 20 will count toward the, um, the 40B ruling or whatever, right? That's capital A, affordable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's only five, only of, them five are of them are actually affordable housing. Or guaranteed the rest affordable. Are guaranteed. Yeah, they could be affordable. They could mm -hmm. be, but, but more they're likely they're going to be market. at market rate. Yes. Right. That's the expectation. Right. Mm -hmm. So five so are guaranteed affordable under the law, but all 20 will count yeah. because they're rental. Correct. So yeah. that means that the other 15 may get sold at market well, rate. They won't be sold at market rate. towards they're the 40 they're 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 No, no, they do count. The way rentals count, Kevin, is that as long as one quarter, this is the way Avalon worked, as long as one quarter of them are dedicated to no, forever, no. then all count. Yeah, count. And, and, and I'm going to re emphasize again because I have seen too much frustration in this town on this as we all bar <coughs> that you know, this is really going to happen this way. I want to. Yeah. <laughs> I can. Is it clear? Jack. Yeah. <laughs> Having been on the Affordable Housing Committee when we worked on this, Donald Stasco um, was proposing this and originally did not have 20 units. <coughs> so, um, and I don't want to go deep into the woods on the, on the intricacies. Um, but the bottom line is by increasing it to 20 and making those five, and they all have to be rentals, that brings it into compliance with what is needed, mm -hmm. and it has to stay that way. There's no wiggle room in that. And, and uh, Donald Stasco, the Some owner. Some of those people mentioning names. Yeah. Oh, well, okay, but he, he'd already it's mentioned it. It's he'd already mentioned it. That's the only reason I brought it up. Right. Um, <clears throat> but that was... Um, it was very clear that was the agreement, and there is no wiggle room. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Thank you for underscoring that. Right? Yeah. So is that, okay. yeah. That's it. So, mm -hmm. so that's 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 part of the overview of what's coming. So, so mm -hmm. now there's a separate parallel track that's also happening. <laughs> so, um, and and so this involves a potential one article. So, uh, this site, the two ends of it are the ones that are developed right now. So there's a septic system at the 390 part, and this is such as 380. I'm sorry. I think the other one's 400. Well, right? yeah, so, uh, mm -hmm. so the 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 the, the, the septic system at each end. Uh, and, and for complicated reasons, I will not get into. The DEP is now engaged in this because the whole parcels flow has triggered a um, uh, a requirement that um, the DEP now regulate. So when the flow, when, when the wastewater flows reach a certain level, which I believe is 10,000 gallons. So, so, the, so the rule, the Paul Kears 39 old coach road is not vice chairman of the Affordable Housing Steering mm -hmm. Committee, which I apologize I couldn't make earlier for the, uh, the beginning part of it. Um, the situation that the town manager is describing is there, there is a uh, statute, I believe, where that if you have common ownership of contiguous property, um, that pumps more than 10,000 gallons per day, then it rises to uh, a different level of oversight for uh, aspects of fluid management on the property. 
aspects of what uh, of, of wastewater mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. treatment management. So, 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 so that that contiguous sites would be the ones we're looking at. Right. So it's three little gray buildings. Yeah. The middle one is yeah. the one that's to be developed. Mm -hmm. So originally there was a septic system proposed for the the unit the building would have the affordable housing. Mm -hmm. the, the septic system at Feng Shui has had some challenges and it's been considered a failed system. It's still being managed, so it's not dumping pollution into the environment, but it, it's the system has not been working up. Uh, it's an old system, both ends are old. The supplemental system has actually been updated, mm -hmm. and without going into great detail, as a supplemental piece that was added to it. It's a little more complicated. It's The, the acronym is FOG, fats, oils, and grease, among other things, because they cook and do other things that can stop a child. So it's a pre-treatment that, that cleans it before it goes to the system. So, so basically what the DEP has come out and said, it's okay, that's under, you can't do septic care anymore. So you can either do two things. You can either hook up to the sewer system. The town sewer system? Yeah, or whatever system exists. And in this case, it's the towns. Or build your own, like Avalon has and, and Cook Estates have. have. Do your own on-site sewage treatment, or, or package treatment. Or type tank control. I don't think that's allowed. I think you have to, I, because it's commercial, I think the only two options <coughs> is on-site treatment, which has different variations. And, um, and again, I, I'm not an engineer, so please don't ask me about those levels specifically. Or cooking the sewer. With conversations that I've had, multiple conversations, um, it seemed that uh, exploring uh, connection to the sewer system made sense, at least to have a conversation mm -hmm. about it. Uh, it's not required. Obviously, you could have an on-site treatment plant. There are some... Uh, the, 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 di the difference, but they both treat the water. The difference is that it, once you hook them into the sewer, it's, a, it's kind of a forever fix, at least from our perspective. Um, and it, it's, a, it's, a, the, it's better environmentally if you don't have any impacts on the immediate area. Peppermint Brook rides right through all the towns, big chunk of the town's water supply flows through this area and flows on to Lily Pond. An on site sewer treatment plant discharges. And um, if there's an accident or a problem, it would be problematic if it happened here. Uh, obviously, those things shouldn't happen, but it could. So the longer term, more solid solution would be sewer. Both of them are acceptable, but the sewers would be. That said, Mr. S uh, the owner uh, approached for, for a citizen's petition a year and change ago uh, and to, to, to hook up this parcel. The sewer commission uh, wasn't supportive. The citizen's petition was pulled. A year goes by, you know, we, we flash forward to today. In the interim, this has been approved for afford 20 units of affordable housing. The select one has said affordable housing is a very, one of your four top issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, the DEP is now involved saying the whole site can't be can't be septic, you gotta do something else. So the conversation is kind of <coughs> renewed. Uh, I think Carrie's at one of the meetings as the liaison mm -hmm. when we talked about this with the sewer commission a month or two ago. And uh, so, so what's being reviewed now with the owner's team is uh, a proposal, and again, so I'll refer you back to the map for a second. So, one proposal, and this is not engineering plans, would be to connect this entire site uh, uh, with a connection that would run right along Chief Justice Cushing Highway to a pre existing town pump station. Um, at, at, is it Tupelo? I guess it's Tupelo Road. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, am I saying it right? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> And um, and, well, and 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 a this would be paid for by the developer of the, this parcel entirely. Uh, B there would be a pre-treatment component so that you know all of the stuff that's not going to septic should be going to the town system because that would cause trouble too. Um, um, and, and, and three would add you know it would add long-term stability and capacity to the site. Um, the um, so. It would also require a series of state permits. There's a couple of uh, A, DOT would have to be involved, and B, DEP would have to be involved because this falls within 500 feet um, of flow that goes into the town water supply and through a public water supply. Uh, Senator O'Connor's office has been engaged in these conversations as well and has you know, offered to help facilitate any state permits that are necessary. That all said, uh, and we've been talking with the Sewer Department Commission about this, um, the Sewer Commission has been um, concerned about this application, uh, and I don't want to speak for them, but their position has been that we didn't like it last year. Why do we like it this year? Um, my, my discussion with them has been, look, the selectmen have made affordable housing a major component. The DEP is now involved. Uh, my charge has been to, you know, to try to get this together. We've had a lot of conversations with groups, including the affordable housing uh, team. And uh, so we're pulling together a proposed warrant article that would expand the sewer district to include this. The Board of Selectmen at that point will either say, after a conversation, yes, we want to continue to have this conversation, or the Board of Selectmen can also say, no, we're not interested. Um, the Sewer Commission has been a little bit 
concern. Um, and, and by the way, the, the bylaws, just to be clear, do permit, uh, or the, actually the enabling statute that created the sewer district was amended in 2013. It, number one, allowed for the creation of these sewer districts, and I, if you remember, in town meeting 2014, those were all adopted by town meeting. Um, so there's a provision that even if the sewer commission wasn't in favor of expanding it, town meeting can still expand with a two-thirds vote. Otherwise, it's a normal majority vote. That's happened before in the past. So, so let me just give it's, it's a majority vote if the sewer commission votes for it. And then it's a two thirds of what if they if vote. If they against. have a two thirds opposing it, then the level for approval of town meeting is higher. That's what the. So, fire. just to frame, you know, and so what, one of the things that this board's going to be asked to do, you're proposing, is, is uh, uh, to look at a warrant article that will allow for this, this sewering uh, arrangement. So, at which time that'll be a very fulsome. We're not going to have that tonight. It's a very fulsome discussion we're going to have because that's a uh, that's always a big issue in town. Is we're going to need to hear from sewer and the public. We'll have to probably do some kind of I don't know whether to do a hearing or what. We want this fully threshed out in terms of we'll have to decide what we need to hear from. Right. Uh, the process of deciding that it won't be a casual management. It, it, when you go to Tupelo Road, yeah. Yeah. what is the the pipes then go? That's a pump. That's a there's a pump station. And so just and then then, then, pumps, it, then, then it pumps. What direction up, is it going? Then in? it goes it goes up Bear Hill, and then so okay. there's a yeah. you, at that point you need to pump it up and over. And then to get down eventually, and then, and then it goes to the sewer plant. To the one in Elm Street, right? Yes. Yeah, that's how the wires yeah, go. That's, right, that's where that's where everything eventually goes. Now, and so then the issue would be either do that or the alternative would be and the developer way. would need to go through that. And I guess we're going to have to understand what the those two are and which we want to support. Yeah. So it's going to be a lot of education. Uh, Diane so I Paul. just want to clarify when the developer had previously proposed a pipe into the system, um, it, it ultimately is a town meeting decision. So, so the sewer commission was against it, but it did come before the board of selectmen, and the board of selectmen took a vote to not set, not recommend that warrant article. So it wasn't this, I just want to clarify, it wasn't the Sewer Commission's decision. It was ours not to put it on the warrant for a whole host of reasons, well, and it wasn't this particular process. It, it was a system petition, so you voted not to recommend it. Not to recommend right, it to right, town, right, right. And then it eventually got pulled. Right. But, yeah. Could this come up as, as a citizen's petition? I, I, just, I, well, it could in theory, I think based on past history, I think there's a, there's a consensus that it doesn't go. We're going to try it this way as in the next right. way to try and, it. And, and it's based on, you know, there's a, and again, I'm not going to, if you want to hear from Paul, I'm sure he has lots to say, <laughs> but uh, the, the, uh, the affordable housing component is now been, you know, again, a year later, the selectmen have made this a top four role. We have, as, as you've heard, we have a, a need, the town has a need to get to the 40B just to control its own destiny, right? And not to oh, yeah. stop the okay. conversation. So is, is the implication then that if if this sewering didn't occur, that development's not going to occur? No. Because no. I have a concern about that because if I'm driving by it, it's already half development. No, 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 no. Right. Well, it, it, so yeah. th there's, th there's a complicated so. tiered approval process for that, by the way. Right. So the framing is going up. Uh, th that's being monitored closely. So th th that, that building... Um, that building is, is the development process complicated with being watched very closely. So, so, so is this a separate issue? It's a separate issue, uh, but it, I will From tell you that it's been watched closely. I've been on the phone in my car and at lots of other places over the last few weeks about this. Uh, and, and so, no, it does not. So, so the only reason that we're talking about certain though is because of the affordable housing component. Otherwise, this would just be a private development. Well, that's why I keep going back. If we didn't do this, are we still going to get the affordable housing? The, the, that's what the approval is for. That said, the DEP's engagement has changed. It, it, before, it could have been just a septic system, and then it wouldn't even come to the board at all because a septic was an option. Now, this, that's not an option. Septic is a fairly inexpensive, tried and true system, but right. the DEP will not allow that now. So, the, the, uh, this now has two options an expensive on site treatment plant or, or a hookup to the sewer system. So, those are the. the so, one of the things in making our decision. I think we're going to need to understand the implications of either way. Yep. What are right. the implications financial into the community? Yeah. And after all the input, if we do the sewer, and what are the implications financial into the community? Yeah. Out of respect to the developer, too, I'm sure. You know, um, you know, if if we, we if we demanded that the, we just need to know what the consequences of those decisions will be mm -hmm. before we're going to have to know. All, this is pretty complicated. Yeah. That's why we're being right. briefed now. 
before we can take the step of actually putting this on a warrant article yeah. because uh, putting something on a warrant article, actually I didn't mean to tie it into it, but as we said, is one of our majors for the community looks for mm -hmm. us to do yeah. that properly. So this is this is a natty little problem, to, or a natty big problem, I would say. So the, the, the only but Paul wanted to get in, but unless you the, want to the, the only way that the, the point that you're making is the only way to have this conversation is to frame it this way. Now, at the end of the day, it's this board's decision whether to put on a warrant in this official process. Right. So, uh, but the, the best way to, to, to tee up that conversation, which has to happen, is to go this route. That's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing this. having this discussion today. Paul, then Jack. So, it goes down 3A. Now, the, the other possibility <coughs> is going out the back. There's a small area of wetlands at the back of where the Feng Shui building is. Going out to Sawyer Street, running up Sawyer Street to the hill, and running behind Deer Hill where there's something already attached. I don't know whether that is feasible. So I, 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 because that would take away the state permitting and requirement from 3A. There are more than one ways to to, to, to lay a pipe. Um, the position, position last year was running through wetlands in the back of that. Which that's not a preferred option. Yeah, followed by the town. Um, this at the at the moment seems to be the one that's the, the easiest one to accomplish, um, and also it, it, the the infrastructure already exists uh, at the at the Tupelo Road here. Um, and there's a pumping station behind or anywhere near Pleasant Street. So are you, um, there's a Victory pumping station. That's what this is. That that's well, a I understand that. I'm that's curious if there is a pumping station uh, because uh, the schools. Pump out to Pleasant Street, which goes downhill. Yeah, I, I, they're a little bit up the hill, um, so I, I think I, I don't know if there's a pumping station up there. I think, I'll, okay. uh, but Brian Joyce could explain a lot more of this, and, and believe me, we'll yeah. you'll have a you'll have exhausted uh, uh, the, the the proposal a year ago was to get an easement on the Cooper's No, yeah, I understand. Go up the hill and go to Deer Hill. No, no, the the easement was to go behind uh, the wetlands and punch punch it through to an agreement right. to. Uh, yes, yeah, so exactly. oh, so so yeah. right. The second to that was um, the easement to Cook Estates. Oh, okay, I never saw go right, go, Yeah, go up right to Deer Hill. So that was proposed with the uh, sewer commission. Oh, yeah, I, I didn't see that. So there's a lot more to talk about. So yeah. I, I'll have our professional staff continue to work on the It seems like we do need a lot for yeah. us to be briefed. Right. So, so this is, this is a, 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 a preview. So you can see why I thought yeah. it would be good for us yeah. to say yeah, that. Yeah, I think so. And by the way, if there's, if there's specific questions that anyone has, you're free to combine, you know, pull them together, which will help structure any, you know, we, we want to make sure we cover everything. I mean, so, some of this is going to happen anyway, but if anyone has questions. I think it would be productive if, it's, if you have any questions, send them yeah. to Gris, but carving everybody else and nobody respond, but I think due to the complexity of this and any information we have, so right. is that process is okay, yeah. it doesn't violate the open meeting law. No, this is just a structured question. This is not, I'm not necessarily going to give you answers. It's no, 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 it's just, just to close the question, and then exactly. we all kind of, because it seems like we have a lot of learning to do on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, all so. Pierce, uh, affordable housing. Um, I've been involved with the town manager on this uh, for quite some time. Um, and I, I think to really summarize where we are um, from a year ago when um, the uh, property owner wanted to do a citizen petition to, to kind of move this forward. Uh, a lot had been discovered since then um, between the, uh, the town departments of, of planning and health, um, understanding where uh, sewer's position was, or the commission was, and then working with the state agencies to find out um, what are the issues that could be resolved. So, my suggestion for the selectmen uh, would, would be to understand that what we have basically uh, is an isolated incident that needs a remedy. And uh, the isolated incident basically we've got commercial property that had been developed, that had been approved over the last three years uh, for this development to include affordable housing. In the course of doing that, um, there have been um, additional situations that have caused um, this fluid management issue to come to light, especially with the uh, uh, contiguous uh, <coughs> properties on common ownership. So that kind of changed um, how you can move forward uh, with, with, with doing this. Um, having the, the town water supply underneath uh, doesn't accept it <coughs> the alternative in the long term. Um, the self uh, treatment facility like they have at Avalon is just a fancy septic system which, which has its 
<coughs> uh, sewer uh, seems to be the, the strong advocate to, to do it. My recommendation would be um, to get the um, parties involved and <coughs> some subject matter experts to take a look at um, the proposals of what can be done and what are the, uh, the basically the roadblocks or the uh, resistance to having that done. What, what are those issues? Um, I, I have found that over the last year of working with the town manager on trying to come up with a remedy that in this town, if you if you say water or sewer, you're going to have 90,000 people, uh, which we only have 8,000 in the town, but you get 90,000 opinions, right? Yeah. Everyone's going to come out and talk about sewer over here, over there, and, and, and all over the place, and it your scope creep just, just multiplies. I don't think that's what we're talking about, though, right? I, I'm, I'm just letting you know what's going to occur. Um, if um, you don't first focus on um, this isolated incident with the developer, the sewer commission, the town manager, the planner, as to um, what are the remedies that could be done, and what are the the tasks and what are the, the barriers to get over that. And once, I think once you understand that, then I would say, yeah, let's 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 understand what the public perspective is. <coughs> um, I know we want to put the, uh, something on the article, um, an article in for the warrant on it. But you know, before you do that, I think you know you should understand what what really the issues are and what are the roadblocks that people have. No, I, I, agree. Before that, you that, go I think that's what we sort of decided to do, right? Yeah. yeah. But you're emphasizing it, and I think that's validly emphasized. Anything else? Uh, no, that's it. I just if, no. If, if the selectmen get involved with the parties that are involved first before we go um, forward with um, having some public hearings on, on it, I think that would be. Favorable. Well, we're so going to let Chris. So, we, yeah, so we're working <coughs> to come up with uh, a proposal that you can then vet. Okay, I mean this has to be done in public. It's the way this all works at this point. So okay. um, we'll work. Um, as we would other on other ways, working uh, to get the. Uh, as many facts together and a, and a comprehensive plan together so you can all consider look at the different options and say does this warrant us putting on the warrant <laughs> right can okay uh all right chat just, just you asked a, you brought up a very good point earlier which is are, are these affordable housing units these 20 units are they being held hostage to getting any of these things approved that's what i think you asked earlier and i didn't know if there was an answer to that there's a quid well, no, no, there's, there's no, so the answer is no, they're not linked. So you don't have to do sewer to do the affordable <coughs> units. The reason, though, that you're having the conversation about sewer is because of the affordable units. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be that pressing. So the, the, the that, <coughs> uh, what you're saying is the affordable units take the flow over the limit, which requires this. Is that what the issue is? Yeah, right. Well, to a certain extent, the um, whatever you whatever resides in that building, right, is going to produce a certain level of, of, of fluid, irrespective of whether irrespective of who. Okay, so that's that's clear. So the affordable. What I want to try to do is take the affordable units out of the equation, so they don't become a marker. They don't become. Well, uh, the challenge with this, and again, I, you, you you touch on the very key point here, Jack, is that they you know. They're parallel and they're linked, but they're not. They're, you don't have to have the sewer to have the affordable. That said, mm -hmm. the, the 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 enabling statute does allow the sewer commission, on its own motion, to extend sewer service to public facilities, including affordable housing development. Okay. <laughs> so they have the authority under the under the statutes to do that on on their own. They they to this point not chosen to be a policy making board. And, and make those kind of calls on their own, so it's typically done in town meeting. Um, now, that doesn't mean they have to do it, though. It's absolutely clear in the, in the, in the enabling section they are not required to do that. They have the option to do that. Um, and again, because of the DEP's involvement, and if this was, again, if, this, if, this, if something was an option, that was the originally part of the plan, we wouldn't even be talking. When that came off the table and DEP got involved, and that had to do with the, the and actually the trigger of that was actually the failure of 380, which led to a, a review of this and said, Whoops! This actually triggered the DP review. Um, it changed the parameters, and it became one of two options. So at this point, the question is: Does the town want A or B? Uh, and and the only way to get A, which is sewer, uh, it would be for the selectmen to say yes, we want to do it and, and put it on. If the selectmen say, based on a big public conversation, no, then it, the default is the on-site sewer treatment plant. So, so there, affordable there, there, housing is not 
it's not a, it, 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 so we want to get that off the table. Yes. Okay. Good. Sewer, sewer commission, Sorry. by itself, mm -hmm. under a, a new Massachusetts statute, right. is allowed to deed this property a commercial sewer, and they can put it in without town meeting vote. Okay. The, town of Cohasset, the town of Cohasset had actually exercised that law when they put in the new senior center. Okay. They made that a separate sewer district and they put it in. At the time, that statute was written, I believe, by our town attorney. By Council Durant. It was adopted by the state of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and we got the um, Wilcock Commons in. Mm -hmm. So because now it's on the books in the state, uh, sewer commissions can do that. Mm -hmm. Our sewer commission... Um, said that's nice, but that's not what we like to do. We like to go in front of the town and let people know what we're doing. So, um, because of the affordable housing unit, they do have the right to deed that as um, a commercial sewer zone. And they can but they're not exercising their rights. Which and they is can vote on it, point. and they can put it in tomorrow. Right. right. But they so they can work with it. Okay. Right. So, and so part of this has been, I, I've been in front of the sewer commission, and they've been a little bit concerned about this concept of other boards honing in on their turf. And the point I've made to them repeatedly is that's not what this is about. This is not about turf. This is about a bigger policy question. Mm -hmm. And I said, if the selectmen want me to stop the conversation, they can just tell me to stop the conversation. Um, and I, that's my, I'm here at, 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 to, to follow the policy directions of the board of selectmen. I said, the, this is a, about having a conversation. It's not about usurping the sewer commission's authority. And I met with their chairman the other day to remind them that, you know, that number one, that's the override of them anyway. <laughs> Um, if the town chose, but this is not a, nothing's happened yet. This is just a conversation. Right. And That's one right. of the important things that the board has charged me with over the last six years is to make sure there's room for a conversation. As I told them the other night, and I'll tell the, everyone here today, I'm agnostic as the outcome. I have no thumb on the, on the scale on this. So it's really, my whole job here is to make sure there's a robust public conversation. So the votes are yours. Yes. yes. That's, that's, so I okay. just want to be clear about that. Yes. You did make that. Uh -huh. Just two clarifying things. One, in terms of us developing questions that we think we want addressed um, in this sewer conversation. I would not co copy the whole board and copy the chairman, so you're aware in terms of facilitating the conversation, but just our questions distributed amongst ourselves could be considered deliberation yeah. because it's, it's we could I think be only expressing the response, but we can, that's a careful way to do it, but I think that you can do it as long as nobody responds. Um, but we can be more careful if you want to. Yeah. And then I just, uh, you probably heard my phone go off because I heard that there needs to be townies <laughs> in, in mm -hmm. the building and it is Tupelo, not Tupelo. Okay. Uh, Tupelo. My, my apologies. So, <laughs> thank you out there for watching. Yes, my I love it. I love our viewers. Tupelo. <laughs> the trees pronounced Tupelo. Right. Okay. okay. Anything else on this? No, that's it. So I hope that, so this, more to come. So what is the action item? Uh, so I'm going to be working on uh, putting a proposal together that could become a draft warrant article, and then presenting it back <coughs> to the selectmen, and then figuring out where they and, and getting any other input at that point. They they they, they, they tell me to get. And in parallel to that, there's a proposal going to the housing trust. Well, the affordable housing is a whole separate track. Yeah, so right, the, right. the affordable housing, the approval of that is going to the affordable housing trust and then back to the board of selectmen at their next meeting for approval of the housing, the affordable housing. Oh, just to, you're talking about the housing plan? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. not specifically the 390. No, no, no okay. specifically 390s. The, the, the way that has to be DHCD approved, you have to get town sign off. Okay. And those sign offs are apparently the affordable housing trust and the board of selectmen. That's how it works. That's how Avalon works, apparently. Well, there's no affordable housing okay. trust at that point. But, so that, that, there's two different tracks here. Okay. Okay. That one's going to run independently. Okay. And then make sure we're clear on if there are any questions, then we decided you send them to Chris and you can send a copy to me. We won't distribute it to the board just to be careful on the open meeting law, okay? All right. Anything else on this? Nope. Good. All right. Thank you very much for the edge. Okay. Anything else on your update? Uh, Chris. I, I just very quickly, I, I had the opportunity to speak at the Northeast Energy and Commerce Association last Thursday at the invitation of Tanya Bodell, um, and it was a, a, a town's response to the world, to how energy is moving in the, with green and, and, and 21st century stuff. So it was great to be able to share some of the great things we've done. Um, and one of the key things that came out of that conversation is we've been talking about doing a microgrid here in town. Uh, so 
uh, I mentioned that, and I was hit by four or five people afterwards, including the gentleman who's been managing the pilot project for the state, uh, which is now about to go into phase two, and several other people are interested in working with the tenant developer plan to present the phase two. So I know we talked about a microgrid, and a microgrid basically is a way to come off the grid if there's a power failure issue and keep a section of the town powered. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that the Alternative Energy Committee is going to be picking up those conversations next week and seeing if we can't come up with a plan to see if the state will include us in, in, in round two. So I just want you to know so that, uh, that that's ongoing. So. Good. OK. Yeah. All right, selectman comments. Uh, Diane? I have nothing. Um, Nothing. Well, I have to say again, I think the teen center's got to be one of our priorities. So that's all I have to say. Okay. And I'm all set myself. So with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 This meeting aye. is adjourned. All right. Okay. Turn the TV off and everybody can watch the debate. Debate time. Was that tonight? Oh, yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. Just, just fighting away at it right now, I'm sure. Um.